Do you like chick shows, Mike? <laughs> I feel like you're such well, a chick flick kind of kind of guy. I like, will say. Did you watch like Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants and like <laughs> Pretty Little Liars? Well, so we're gonna actually. The theme of the show is going to be a lot about like men and women dynamics and stuff like that. So we'll get into that later. But I will say, oh boy, the key to a successful marriage sometimes is actually. Finding sh- one of the important things that I sort of learned early yeah, on in my going marriage was like finding shows that you can both enjoy, and you know, because you don't want to be in like I'm in my room watching my show, and then you're in your room watching your show <laughs> over time. So when I was very early in my marriage, like we. First of all, in college, I used to be into 90210 Melrose Place because that was how you met the girls. So we would go on Thursday nights, we would hang out at the sorority house to watch 90210 in Melrose Place. And we'd be like, we're not going out to the party until after we've got our, our 90210 in. So and of course, that was just to meet girls. But then when I was married, we, we were into the Gilmore Girls. So I Jesus. loved the Gilmore Girls when I was like before we had kids. And then lo and behold, I ended up having three daughters. So, yeah, I guess I do like chick movies. That's I have really a lot of recommendations for you. I'm sure Tasha does too. Like, oh, I probably have some recommendations for you guys. <laughs> Hit me up. I need to know. I've run out of shows lately. That's really funny. Broadcasting from the Woodpecker Studio in the great state of New Hampshire, welcome to the Sounds Like a Search and Rescue podcast, where we discuss all things related to hiking and search and rescue in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Here are your hosts, Mike and Stump. And we're live, episode 73. All right. The ladies are in the house. Right on. Let's bring them back. All right, Stom. So I'm um, starting off hot here. I've got a couple of random news stories I wanted to throw at you. Okay. Um, a guy gets eaten by a lion at a zoo in Ghana. So apparently this happens occasionally where you'll hear, like I know that this happened in SeaWorld where a guy, I think he was sort of, you know that naked guy in Zealand where he, he did the, the acid? I think a guy did that okay. and ended up in one of the, um, the pools at SeaWorld down in Florida one time. So this guy must have... For whatever reason, Ghana has a zoo called Accra Zoo, and this guy decided that he was going to enter the lion enclosure around noontime on Sunday. Yeah, the lion's den. And um, they don't really know what the motivation is, but he was attacked and injured by one of the lions and eventually died from his wounds. So he wasn't fully Hmm. eaten. He was just attacked. He was nibbled on. He died. (laughs) <laughs> he wasn't fully eaten. You he know. wasn't. He's a, Just a few choice parts were taken. Yeah. Do you think, um, Stomp, that the executive producer would would attack you like that? Oh, she has. Oh, absolutely. Luna. Luna is very feisty. Feline. Yeah. Nibbling you have to treat her well. Yep. She'll let you know. She's a step down from a lion, actually. She's more like a penguin. True. (laughs) Yeah. If you were going to get eaten by a wild animal, what animal would you prefer to get eaten by? Oh, definitely a bear. A bear? Why? You want to be eaten by a bear? In the woods all the time, yeah. And then he's pooping me out in the woods. (laughs) Just live in the woods. I don't know. (laughs) Have you thought about that? I mean, I I hadn't thought about it until this very moment, but I also have to agree, bear, but I'm going to be specific. I want it to be a grizzly bear because I want this shit over with fast. Well, that's, that's my motivation. Like, I'm, I'm not as concerned about where I end up as Alexandria. Mrs. Stomp is. I already messed it up. Um, it's fine. <laughs> but You're I just want it to now. be done. I just want it to be done really quick. Little screaming involved. Well, I think that's where Mike's going with this is like, how do you get it over with quick rather than how you, how you want to end up on the other end of the animal? <laughs> my, my biggest fear is that it's going to be a moose. Like anyone that knows me knows that I'm you absolutely... You love moose. Yes, I, I love moose in this terrifying way. I, I see them all the time on trail. People are like, really? I've never seen a moose. And I'm like, just come hiking with me because they're, they like to join me all the time. And I'm so afraid of them. 
Like, I don't ever want to see them. Like, I just have no interest. I'm terrified. Yeah, I do feel like if if I was going to have an encounter (laughs) where I died with a wild animal, like, I would much rather get, like, run over by, like, a moose or an elephant or um, what are those giant pigs called? Like, I'd rather just get, like, gored or run over (laughs) instead of getting eaten. An elephant? (laughs) Yeah, but uh, I'm... Not in the whites, but like a moose yeah. isn't going to just like run you over, though. It's just going to keep kicking you in the face over and over. And it's just going to be misery and terrifying. It's go with the bear. Go with the bear. Have you seen the, the video of the guy that got chomped by a, a gator, a crocodile? He's swimming and this gator comes up and just chomps him. And then there's a second video of the gator holding the, the individual's like upper torso and just floating around and people taking pictures yeah like that's no way to go oh nothing to do with water like a shark oh. an alligator no. a hippo no nothing can it be like a prehistoric no. thing hippos are terrifying like too. i would want to go i'd love to be stomped by like a t-rex like just get it over with quick <laughs> is that a possibility stomp wants to be stomp yes I want to be. We have to lay some ground rules. Can these be things that are currently living? You know, can they be fictional characters, okay. yeah. animals? Yeah, that's what I want to know. Stomp. Like, if that's the case, then I have a whole different answer. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. Well, speaking of pretend, although hopefully there's no children listening, Santa's Village. Um, there was an employee hurt while operating a roller coaster there. So, this is the um, the name of this roller coaster is. Um, I think it's Santa's Doom. Pooji's Penguin Spinner, I believe, <laughs> is what it's called. And I think Pooji is like their um, penguin mascot. So they have, obviously they have the elves up there, but Pooji has got a couple of like slides and stuff like that. So when they put in the water park, I think Pooji became like one of their things. So this is like a spinning <laughs> roller coaster. And I think the employee got hit somehow or he fell off the platform it's over by like the the water flume area so i guess he's okay but i found that interesting so i also stomp wanted to ask you and now that i have we have mrs stomp and tasha here we can get your opinions too between santa's village storyland and wheels tail and i think i know where you two are gonna go the stomps but between those three what what do you how do you order those tasha you can take it first Uh, well um I don't have children, so it's been a hot minute since I've been at either or any of, any of those places. Um, I have fond <laughs> memories of Storyland as a kid. You know, like, I remember the big pumpkin you got to go into, though I was really disappointed by the princess castle. Like, I thought, like, I could go in a castle and you pretty much, like, walk in a, a room. And I remember, like, being, like, eight and being like, well, this is disappointing. <laughs> but e- e- even, even with that disappointment, I'd still probably have to stick with Storyland as, you know, I liked the fairy tale stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like Storyland is like nightmare fuel, though. Like that little elf in the tree and all that stuff is <laughs> scary. I love Santa's Village, number one. Getting the cookies, punching the number on the elf, the uh, the monorail thing. It's all that's where I go. And then I'd say Storyland, and I just never been to we- Wheels Tale at all. But I think Tasha, there is an adult night at Storyland that you should. I- check I've out had right some before. friends tell what? me about this. It's like a <laughs> drinking event or something. Yeah. Yes. It seems like a pretty far like drive that. for a drinking night with friends for me. Like I could just be like, "Hey, do you want to come over and sit by the campfire?" But but yeah, I've considered You'd have it. to add it on to like you'd have to add it on to like if you happen to yeah, be up like there. Like to the Wildcats or something. Like yeah. yeah. You're like, "I'll tell you my own stories. You don't have to go to Storyland." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. What about you, Mrs. Stomp? How do you order those? Uh, I've only been to the whale's tail out of the three and I also don't have children. I have stepkids, but Jamie and I went there, just him and I, we had like an adult day there and that was pretty fun. <laughs> but I've never been to Storyland or Santa's village. Oh, stomp. Whale's tail. You can go a doubt. to, you, you can go to the Storyland and Santa's village. There's no excuse to not go. I've never been to Santa's, but I've been to Storyland and I actually had a good time. <laughs> Oh, uh, you know, with, with my daughters when they were a little younger. I mean, it was a great time. There's some really fun stuff there. But as an as an adult, like Whale's Tail, hands down, is the coolest spot around. No question about it. It's not crowded. It's clean. And it's awesome. 
currently understaffed, though, because nobody can find staff anywhere. So you're on your own. Sounds safe. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, those water slide <laughs> attendants, they're right up there with like the uh, registry of motor vehicle like workers as far as like unnecessarily mean jobs. True. Yeah, true. And they're like, so half funny. of them are like 15. When I went, when I went there, I was like, exactly. I made my partner at the time. I was like, you go stand at the bottom. So when I get out of this, like if something happens, I want you to jump in for me. Like, I don't want this kid. Like he can't even grow yeah. facial hair yet. Like, no, he's not responsible for my safety. Like, no, he's not going to save you. Yeah, no. They just want to look cool. They don't want to save anybody. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right, well, anyway, so that's that's the ordering between Santa's Village Storyland and, and Will's Tale. So no no definitive answer there, but mm-hmm. I say Santa's Village. I get the last say in that one. So, um, so Stomp, I got a note here. Massachusetts just passed a law saying that they are going to be not allowing sales of um, gas-powered vehicles starting in 2035, I think, or maybe 2036. So it got me thinking, like, I definitely see a fair number of electric vehicles on the trailheads um, up here in New Hampshire, but I do feel like like my use case being from Massachusetts, like it is a little bit tricky. Like if I'm doing a one day thing, driving from Massachusetts up to like your side of the whites and then coming back, like I've got to recharge my car, maybe getting down there, especially when it's hot with air conditioning and whatnot. So what are your thoughts around long term? Are we going to see more and more electric vehicles in these rural areas or what, what do you think the risks are there? Well, I don't think you're going to see a, a ban up in say New Hampshire. I mean, that's probably not going to happen in the near future. Yeah. Um, logistically, I think that's the biggest problem that most of these states have. Even California is underserved by these charging stations. So, you know, it's like I have no issue with them, but logistically, you have to have the infrastructure to pull it off. So, I think is 10 years too early? Maybe not for Mass, but for most other states, yeah, it's too early. Yeah, and I, I think that the, the bonus of this is it's sort of a forcing mechanism to hopefully get them to improve the scalability of battery technology because I really don't care about electric vehicles. What I care about is the Jetsons car and like the flying vehicles that I think could potentially like come out of this. Surpass. I do think that, yeah, I do think that like lightweight batteries because they already have like a prototype for this thing, but I think you'll get lightweight flying vehicles with battery technology that can actually travel maybe, you know, 50 miles low altitude flying here's here's the deal my my biggest question is like in colder climates what happens with the like fishing game they actually have some new vehicles new trucks that are a battery and uh i'm curious because i've been on missions with some of these people in the coldest like minus 10 minus 20 at like say musalak and I'm just curious how well those batteries are going to do in that cold climate versus, you know, diesel or just, you know, carbon, whatever. It'll be fun to find out. We will find out actually real soon. Yeah. And I do know that like even in hot weather, when you have to use the air conditioning, I think the range that you get for electric vehicles right now, is it, it, it significantly impacts it. So it's not just cold. It's also hot. That yeah. You have to worry about. Yeah. Interesting, so, but I uh, I was thinking about this too because when I finished my Pemi loop, I got back and my car battery was dead. Your regular my, gas yeah. car, was yeah, dead. my regular gas. What car, happened? So I had to get a jump. I don't know. It's just my battery was gone. My car has like one hundred and ten thousand miles on it, so it was time. Huh. But I you didn't leave something on, like a little daylight or something. No, they just said it was time. <laughs> It's time. <laughs> it's time. It's time to put the battery to dead. Dead. How about you, Tasha? What's your take? My my take. Oh oh. When we first started talking about this, I was like, "Are flying car? Is this? A, are we making a joke?" I didn't. I, I was a little lost. That's for real. That's for. I oh, mean, yeah. I, when I watched the Jetsons, I the thought Jetsons. it was going to be for real. But I um I could pretend to have an opinion, but I I know very little about car batteries or any kind of any 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 mechanical thing whatsoever so same um, as as far as like going green i'm all for it but i don't i don't have anything to speak of intelligently about the sustainability of them and you know high altitude or cold temps or anything like that yeah but that's an interesting point that you make mike is that everybody's pushing the electric car but 
there's been so much motion on the whole drone front with automobiles like drone cars. It's moving really fast. It is, yeah. I could see that overtaking a, a basic vehicle. Yeah. And Tasha, these the when I say like these these um flying cars, essentially what it is is it's like a it's a quadcopter a, it's a giant drone basically with the with the same blades that you'll see in the dr- the drones and it's a f- four four blades or usually eight blades but four points and then it, they're probably about 200 pounds they're all composite material and there's enough power in those batteries to actually lift a 200 pound person and you can fly for i think they say you can fly for like maybe 25 minutes right now but over time as these laws start getting passed i think it's going to motivate manufacturers more and more to to get better with their battery technology and over time we will certainly i think it would definitely have application for search and rescue but i could see you know a commercial or uh uh you know individuals buying these cars as well it sounds absolutely terrifying yeah. not not for me i'm not going up in the mini helicopter <laughs> piloted by myself like no i'll I'll just hike up i'll I'll hike up (laughs) we'll say hello from from above so So, all right mike do you have a shirt that says elon on it e-l-o-n yes (laughs) can you explain this what does it say I need to know. What, it's Elon um, Phoenix. That, that's oh, it's a location. To. I thought it was like yeah. an Elon Musk shirt or something <laughs> like that. No, no, no. It's, it's a, uh, so Elon is Hebrew for oak tree. Okay. And so they, they like the school was founded in like an oak grove or whatever. But that's uh, funny. yeah, you know, you know the deal. I mean, like basically we moved my daughter into college and then yeah. we all go to the bookstore and my wife and kids, they all want to load up on like, you know, they want a sweatshirt, they the want merch. a long sleeve t-shirt, they want a t-shirt <laughs> and they just throw me this shit. They're like, here's a $5 t-shirt and isn't it great? And meanwhile, I'm like so happy with my $5 t-shirt. They're spending $400 on sweatshirts and all this other stuff that I don't notice until I get the credit card bill. It's hilarious. Well, I'm so, glad it, yeah. it is not a, a Musk shirt. Uh, he's the greatest, but you wearing a Musk shirt would be a little cringe. <laughs> yeah, that guy's a trip. He's a little bit of a trip. So, um, but, well, speaking of Elon, we, I do have a couple of things about pop culture news. House of Dragons. We got Mrs. Stomp here. Maybe she has some feedback oh, for boy. House of Dragons. We got a 75-inch TV two days ago, (laughs) just in time for the newest episode. We're in a movie theater right now. Yeah. I thought these dragons were going to eat me the other night. (laughs) Yeah, my plasma. I had a plasma TV for like 10 years, and it finally bit the dust. And uh, she and I were chomping at the bit and ended up going out, and we got this giant TV. It's funny. It's like the cost difference between, say, what we had previously and this this larger one was negligible. So we bit the bullet, and, and it's been wild, like, just to see these movies and shows we're on like, a larger screen. We're like, what movie screen. should we watch next? We just want to watch all these movies. So like, <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> but back to the show. The show has been awesome. Uh, the second second episode is really cool. Won't give any spoilers or anything, but uh, I think they're finding their rhythm. Do you watch it, Tasha? Your meme earlier was hilarious. I do. I, know. I was dying over that meme. Um, yeah, no, I, I've, I'm a Game of Thrones fan, and we've been watching the new season. I just What do you think? Um, so, first episode, I was like, you know, I'm a, like I said, huge Game of Thrones. So Questionable. I, I, yeah, I wasn't sure. I was like, it's feeling kind of like soap opera to me. Like, <sighs> we said the same thing. We said the exact same thing. Okay, that makes me feel <laughs> yeah. better because I've had some people argue yep. with me, and I'm like, no, it's just. No. Nope. I'm like, think of. Daenerys and then think about like how how like this new girl is acting like the, the level of, of quality the of thing. acting I was like oh I don't I, I just wasn't feeling it and I thought they pushed yep. like too hard in the first with like the first episode with like a bunch of gore and violence and then like the most cliche way for sex. a woman to die yeah exactly <laughs> that one scene oh we can't I won't no spoilers but yes sex <laughs> and so I, I was, was kind of like hating it uh, last week and I'm also currently rewatching Game of Thrones so it's putting it a really hard you know s- scale for oh, me of yeah. like I'm 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 knee deep in Game of Thrones again so like watching the beginning of this show is I'm like maybe a little too judgmental but this this week's episode I thought they they did a bit better I I 
I started to like some characters and yeah, they'll here. probably die now, but yeah, you know. <laughs> we feel that way too. And we're also like comparing characters, like with the newer episode, we're like, oh, the bad guy. And I was like, he reminds me of Ramsey Bolton. And like, just like everyone matches up to someone I've already seen. So I feel like I'm getting a little judgy as well, but I don't know. We're going to give it a try. I like the fact they're airing it on Sunday nights at nine, just like the old Game of Thrones. Just gives us something to like look forward to on Sunday nights. And, yeah. you know, I like the open. I like that they kept the opening music and but well, they we'll didn't, see. They didn't have the opening music for the first episode, which I thought was a little weird. But then the big question was, will they bring back the theme and have an opener? And they did for the second. That was pretty cool. Yeah. But uh, Mike, what's your take? Because you're you are the Game of Thrones guru here. So, well, there's they're setting the table. They're setting yeah. the table here with um, Corvus Smith. Valerian is is definitely a key player in all of this, and obviously. You know, there's there's some spoilers here, so I won't give them away. But I think the the alliances and how things are set up with who the king decides to marry, and then oh, the yeah, yeah. decision on who the you know the heir to the throne is play into what's going to happen in the future. My understanding is is that they're going to skip forward in time about after about five or six episodes, and then from there it's going to start getting crazy. Hmm. Well, sounds good. We're ready for it in our big 75 inch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got that huge TV. It's really uh, awesome. Um, and then the only other thing I had on my pop culture news stuff is I've been watching this show called Paper Girls on in Amazon Prime, which is actually excellent. Mm-hmm. And it's like uh, these four young girls from 1988 that all meet delivering newspapers in like a Cleveland suburb. I talked about it last week. And then they uh, end up like falling into this like time traveling portal. And they end up trying to sort of like figure their way back to 1988. But there's all, they get to like, they go forward in time to meet themselves, which is pretty cool. Like I, yeah. I've always like liked that concept about time traveling is like what would have so so many time traveling movies and stories are like you have to avoid like interrupting like the the, the past the past right in, or the future and you don't want to disrupt things but this is cool because they sort of just break that and they're just like what they're walking up and saying like I'm WTF. your younger version of yourself which is pretty oh, cool that's interesting do you like chick shows Mike <laughs> I feel like you're such well, a chick flick kind of kind of guy. I like, will say. Did you watch like Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants and like <laughs> Pretty Little Liars? Well, so we're gonna actually. The theme of the show is going to be a lot about like men and women dynamics and stuff like that. So we'll get into that later. But I will say, oh boy, the key to a successful marriage sometimes is actually. Finding sh- one of the important things that I sort of learned early yeah, on in my going marriage was like finding shows that you can both enjoy, and you know, because you don't want to be in like I'm in my room watching my show, and then you're in your room watching your show <laughs> over time. So when I was very early in my marriage, like we. First of all, in college, I used to be into 90210 Melrose Place because that was how you met the girls. So we would go on Thursday nights, we would hang out at the sorority house to watch 90210 in Melrose Place. And we'd be like, we're not going out to the party until after we've got our, our 90210 in. So and of course, that was just to meet girls. But then when I was married, we, we were into the Gilmore Girls. So I Jesus. loved the Gilmore Girls when I was like before we had kids, and then lo and behold, I ended up having three daughters. So yeah, I guess I do like chick movies. That's I have really a lot funny. of recommendations for you. I'm sure Tasha does too. Like, oh, I probably have some recommendations for you guys. <laughs> Hit me up. I need to know. I've run out of shows lately. That's All really right, funny. Right. You know, here's a good hint for you, Mrs. Stomp. If you're ever looking for shows, try to go on and try to find those old WB free shows. So go to WB.com and there's a bunch of these old free shows that are a bunch of girly shows. You'll love them. Have you ever seen Gossip Girl? I haven't seen that one, no. There's just so many shows that come to mind when you're talking about the shows that you like. That's really funny. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so. Oh, in my defense, I have all girls. So it is what it is. Yeah. 
Well, that's funny. My daughters are so into sci-fi and Lord of the Rings and things like that. So, like last night, Mrs. Thump and I watched um, War of the Worlds with Tom Cruise. <laughs> like, it was great. But we had to find something that was testing the new TV, of course. But, yeah. But, uh, no, I get it. Like, that is a, a cool point, sharing, having common interests and uh, loves and passions. I mean, that's super cool for a marriage and important. Tasha, do you and Dan like the same shows? Oh, you're muted, Tasha. Rot roll. Come back, Tasha, come back. <laughs> there I am. Um, yeah, Dan's learned to um, like what I like because I'm, I'm a difficult... Smart yes, man. Yes, I'm a difficult TV watcher. Like, if I... I just won't watch stuff I don't like. There's there isn't much compromise from me on that angle. So he's just he kind of goes, okay, what will you actually watch and continue watching and not get to like season two and be like I'm done with this and make me stop watching it. So he he's kind of come to my side of TV shows and stuff. So I mean it's, it's really good for me. It works out well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It is important, though, to find commonality in your entertainment interests within a marriage. I Mike's trying say. to counsel me here. Like, Tasha, you really need to, like, let Dan watch, like, some of his stuff. Watch something he likes, I, Tasha. I broke down and I did Stranger Things. I was, like, terrified of that show. I'd come home from work and I'd be like, turn this off. But yeah, that, oh, was, yeah. that was a hard one. It was pretty s- scary. We did it. I got through it all. So, yeah, I'm all up to date with yeah. that one. <laughs> yeah. that is a great that's a great show too so all right well we'll be here all day talking pop culture stuff here so stomp so why don't we pivot to um we had a big weekend i got to hang out with stomp it was like a disaster as it always is with stomp so um but and i'm joking but I'll <laughs> but we did the skyline loop so i met stomp at like what time did we meet like seven in the morning in waterville at the osceola trailhead correct and um why don't you take it from there, Stomp, and give the description of the day? Sure. Larson uh, and Travis, the two runners, ran the Skyline Loop, which is basically 32 to 34 miles in the Waterville Valley. It covers Tecumseh, the Osceolas, um, Scour, Tri-Pyramids, and uh, Snows Mountain. And they started at 6 a.m. And... Um, it was a coolish day. It wasn't too bad, but it was a, an oddly humid day for the cool temps, which is interesting. Mike showed up around seven-ish or so at the Osceola Trailhead. There was plenty of parking, so he and I got to hang out for a bit. Um, Larson and Travis showed up about an hour and a half after their start, so they were smoking that first section. Yeah, so they, they started at Tecumseh at like, what, six or so? Six on the dot, yep. And um, yeah, so like an hour 33 in, they showed up at Osceola and we saw them off. And then Mike and I went to the junction of Greeley and Livermore, which is uh, down in Waterville. And uh, from there, Mike, I don't know if you want to cover those hikes that you did while we were there or a little later. Either way is fine. But um, we set up shop with the coolers and nutrition and electrolytes right at that junction, knowing that they would show up again. Roughly within an hour and a half, which they did. Um, They were cruising. They were in great shape. Um, You know, Larson was experiencing some stomach issues that day. So I think it it slowed them down a bit. But um, long story short, they pulled off the loop in... My time is a little quicker, but his time was 38... um, well, no, eight hours, 38 minutes, and X amount of seconds. I can't recall off the top of my head. But uh, that is a new uh, record for the the Skyline Loop. And the first one was set in actually July by this guy named Peter Ward, uh, who set it at nine hours, 13 minutes, and 57 seconds. So it, it was neat. While Mike was out doing his hikes, he was doing some of the spurs off of um, uh, Livermore Road, you know, Goodrich Rock and Timber Camp. Uh, when he came back, we actually went up and determined that it was smarter under the conditions to go into Livermore and set up shop again so that we could hit them when they were coming off of the Tri-Pyramids before they went into Snow's Mountain, the last you know stretch. And uh, that ended up being a really good call because when they showed up, Larson was cramping up a little bit. 
And, uh, you know, I had the Pedialyte and this and that. But the funny part of the story is, you know, Mike and I having to lug out all the gear. And you can you can describe that, Mike, because it was actually really funny. Nobody anticipated that we would have to walk out two extra miles to get to this other junction. So, yeah. Yeah, it's weird, too. Like, I think... In, I, I feel like we have a weird dynamic. It's not like we, we text back and forth about like planning for the show, but like very rarely do we ever like get into detail about stuff. Like you just sort of wing it. And then the same thing with like all of these le- um, FKTs, like with Steve and Larson and all that stuff. Yeah. Like we just, I don't think we cover a lot of details. I'm just sort of like, I'll show up. And I think you're kind of like, I'll show up. And it's always like a lot of running around back and forth. Yeah. And, um, which I sort of love to do. I lo- I'm a glutton yeah, for punishment. I'm like, yeah, whatever. You love it. Yeah, and I'm kind of like, I want to know the details, but I'm not going to bother stomp. So we had like, so you had what, two coolers, right? So decent sized coolers. Yeah, it was Larson's cooler, which was, you know, my, my cooler was a full size cooler, you know, like a yeah. three, four gallon cooler. And then his was maybe like a gallon and a half. And then he had a, a canvas bag of you know medications yeah, like a, a gels. grocery bag yeah yeah exactly and then we yeah, weighed you about know, 20 pounds sure easy and, and my cooler yeah. was packed with ice and i had a, a a camp chair strapped over my shoulder because i'm not going to spend eight hours sitting around you know standing there waiting i'm you know it's going to be comfortable so that's a lot of stuff so tasha stomp had a it's like one of those cheers that the soccer moms <laughs> take to the, watch the soccer game but like <laughs> times two it was like yeah, like when the tables like, that pull out cup holders it, it looked like it looked like a yeah. bro, it looked like the hound's broadsword from game of thrones or yeah or like legolas's <laughs> yeah. little exactly all different so, arrows i appreciate both references <laughs> yeah exactly so we were at um osceola trailhead we drove up no problem then we get to livermore and stomps like well you know we got to go to that little sort of field at livermore it's like what a quarter mile in or something so mm-hmm. we get the two coolers we get the bag stomps got his thing so i'm like all right we'll carry this in then i go off to um do good rich and, and timber camp with the assumption that i'm going to run into larson and travis on the um on the way back i screwed that up but then i get to see stomp and he's like well, we got to go back down livermore and i'm like okay well i'm coming i'm coming and then like next thing you know we're carrying these coolers and this <laughs> chair and all this stuff like two miles in and i i like oh like maybe like a half a mile in stomp is when i started complaining right Oh, sure. I mean, it was heavy, yeah. but it, it's really funny because Waterville was gracious enough to offer a Kubota all-terrain yeah. vehicle to get us out to these junctions. But going that deep into Livermore wasn't part of the factoring. But as the day went on and, you know, at the first junction when they showed up and and they were just like soaked and Larson was like, you know, I'm not feeling 100%. We had to recalculate. And that's where that... that you know, it was just no other choice. We had to go out there. You know, I'm not going to call up Waterville and say, oh, we need that all-terrain vehicle. No, it's two miles, big deal. And it, it was sort of funny, though, because to me, um, it was almost like, you know, search and rescue. You're carrying a litter. It was exactly like that. So I was sort of conditioned for that nonsense. You know what I mean? So in my mind, I'm like, oh, just a little two-mile I go with a cooler. It's like, all right, whatever. Yeah, and I started whining within like, probably within three minutes i was like this is ridiculous like i'm gonna put like the trying to fit like the stuff into my backpack and i was like if i took my giant backpack i could put everything in there i was like oh, crying immediately so yeah you stomp you're a stronger man than i am well i'm, I'm it's specificity of training like you just familiar, it's exactly what it is so for me it was no big deal um but just to to put a bow on this they showed up at that junction and then just after they left for Snows Mountain, I packed everything up really quick and I had to get out those two miles. And I, I'm joking about it, but that's like the fastest known time for somebody carrying coolers down Livermore Road. So I've got that. I won that one. Um, and then when they came out of Snows Mountain, I got a text from Tony Stewart, who's a, a listener and she actually works in Waterville, who, who gave me essentially the previous time, which I was unaware of. So I'm waiting for these guys to show up and I'm thinking, oh my God, it is like an hour left for them to break this time. Eventually they pull out of the trail and I tell them, you're under an hour. And um, I think we calculated it as maybe an hour, uh, a mile and a half before the end. 
and they just threw their packs and their poles into the back of my truck and said, let's do it. We got it. And they just ran. They ran like full sprint to the end. Uh, so pretty awesome time. And again, thanks to EMS and Waterville. They were super supportive. And um, it's nice to see those runners getting props. And the guys that pace them as well, thank you so much. It really helps when you're at the tail end of an event like that and you have that extra support. And I'm really finding that this this endurance community, whether it's White Mountain Endurance, all these athletes, or like the Mount Washington Road Race, it's just such a different community, Mike, than what you and I sort of... Uh, grew up with you know what I mean it seems more cohesive now and bonded uh, it's great I love it yeah and they're competitive but they're supportive like oh, I, I noticed that with the ultra runners like a lot of times like if somebody's doing an FKT or a big project like somebody that even like a past record holder will will jump in and be on the support team and yeah stuff. So it, it's, it's, it's great, awesome it's so cool so that's the story yeah, and then um, Larson's wife and kids were able to see him at the end, too. I saw some video on <laughs> yeah. that. That's great. Oh, it's great. Talk about an inspiration for the kids, you know. And uh, Sarita's so great. The kids are nice, and it was just a nice time. So, happy to help. What's next, Mr. Mad Scientist? Well, Larson's doing a White Mountain 100, and that's this season. So he's just ready to embark that. And I don't know all the details. Uh, he and I did not get to talk too much about it, but I believe it's a 100-mile stretch through New Hampshire, through the Whites, if I remember correctly. But uh, yeah, so that's next on his bucket list. And, uh, you know, um, you know, if we can help out in some way, then we, we will, so... But uh, they're killing it. And you know, the last point on this, I think Larson was sort of disappointed in himself because he was a little under the weather. Um, he thinks he can pull, pull it off in sub six, maybe sub seven, which I, I guarantee they could. But for now, it's a record and, uh, you know, it's a great accomplishment. And he, he said, quote, it's harder than a Pemi loop. Absolutely. I think that was mostly because of the um, the verticals. Like when you're going up Tecumseh, that's that's a hell of a vert. Osceola, maybe not so much, but going up Tri-Pyramids. Yeah, he definitely said, you know, and he's the one that did a triple Pemi. So he did three Pemis in a row uh, just recently. So I guess he's uh, qualified to say. <laughs> yeah, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, I can't even imagine. Like, wow. All right, and then um, Stomp, you got something about Wounded Warriors at Hampton Beach? Is that something oh, you're involved yeah. in, or is that just a plug? It's just a, a plug. We'll we'll provide the link, but it's really neat. Um, at Hampton Beach, um, veterans were out there getting assisted and were able to surf uh, on some of the waves that were coming in. And um, yeah, check it out. It's a really heartwarming story. Okay. I'll awesome. include that in the show notes. And then um, reminders about Reckless and uh, Kilkenny Ridge Stomp. What yeah. So September 11th, we will be doing our live show at Reckless at the Pint House. Show starts at 5, music beforehand. There'll be food. There'll be you know beer on tap and stuff like that at Reckless. So um, I think a ton of people are coming. <laughs> Basically, looking at the event reservation thing, it's it's upwards to like 70 now. So it's, it's, it's going to be packed. Don't tell me that ever again. I'm going to be I'm too nervous as Oh, dude, yeah. It's going to be <laughs> really epic. So, we, you know, that's the flags in the 48 days. So a lot of hikers will be in the area. And, uh, you know, it starts late enough so you can finish your hike and come on in. We may be... Um, visited by some of the members of Flags on the 48 committee or representatives that can give us some updates and, and you know, tell us how the day went. And uh, it's just going to be great. You know, we have some guests lined up and, um, uh, yeah, I, you know, we'll see what happens, but it's going to be great. It's going to be great to meet everybody and uh, watch Mike be so nervous. Yeah, I know Brittany had reached out to me. I got to check my email, but I think some of the folks from the Taylor James Steves Foundation will be there as well. So I'll put a plug into the show notes for that. Okay, as well. So good lord, seventy people. Oh my yes, God. and listeners this should is know. Stomp. You better pull. So, I need some dad jokes. Hook me up. <laughs> and and just so listeners know, we're taking next next week off so we can get ready for this because we have to iron out the script and logistics and sound checking and all that stuff. So we, we will not. Be be publishing next week um but we will see you on the 11th uh let's see we have um 
Let's see. For <laughs> sponsors, just want to do a quick shout out to Spinner's Pizza in Andover, just off of uh, Route 93 in Andover, Dascom Road. Number one pizza in the area since 1994. Stop by and tell dolls and pops that <laughs> she's, she makes fun of my, my tongue tiedness every single time I say that. Not cool, you Mrs. Stomp. You never Stomp. even call her that in person. <laughs> what do you call her? I call her dolls. Of course no, I do. You don't. <laughs> yes, I do. Oh, we're going to get in a fight. Sorry. I had that going on with my in-laws for a long time. There was like a oh, really? six or eight year period where like I didn't call them anything. I had to like, I had to basically have a kid so that I could start calling them Nana and Papa. But before that, I like didn't reference them. I'd be like, hey, you. <laughs> That's hilarious. Like, hey. Hey, hey parents yeah. of the woman I'm married to. That's really Yeah, funny. I was like, I didn't know if I should call them by their first name or if I should call them. Yeah, I didn't know. So I was like, I'll just have a kid. I'll just wait it out until I have a kid. Then they'll have a name. That's really funny. I get it. Yeah, yeah that's really <laughs> funny. Uh, anyway, so EMS, I... EMS is is really uh, is so great. Uh, the Northeast go to for outdoor gear, guidance, education, and more since 1967. Check them out at ems.com and and check out um, Go East because I think they're doing a write up about this Skyline Loop soon, which would be really cool. And of course, at Reckless Brewing, where you'll enjoy the best food, craft beer, and fun just 15 minutes from Franconia Notch. Many 4K footers in less than 10 minutes from the Five Corners. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Well, welcome to episode 73 of the Sounds Like a Search and Rescue podcast. This week, we are going to dive into some more history by welcoming our friend Tasha Spooches. Spooch? Spooch? Spooches. Spooches. Yeah. It's a tricky one. It's a yeah, tricky that's one. another one like I, I didn't pronounce so. Um, Tasha is a pr- prolific hiker and the author of a new book, The Devil Had Been Everywhere. Her book tells the story of Hannah Dustin, who has come up in discussions a few times during the podcast recently. So Tasha will give us the background on Hannah and talk a little bit about um, her book and what motivated her to write this. And then we're also going to get Tasha's perspective along with Mrs. Stomp, who just showed up out of nowhere. We're going to get... No, um, don't mind me. I'm just I'm just like Tasha's squad. I'm just her <laughs> cheerleading squad today. Exactly. <laughs> I super appreciate your presence here. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So we're going to get both of their perspectives on Stomp's least favorite subject, gender dynamics and etiquette while on trail. So we'll learn... Stomp's like kicking and screaming coming into this episode. So we'll learn about um, some of her favorite areas in the White Mountains and get Tasha's perspective on hiking with dogs as well. She's got a little bit of expertise on that. And I also think she's she's a cat owner as well. So um, we might talk cats here. So all this, and we'll wrap up with some recent search and rescue news. I got a feeling we're going to be here for like three hours tonight, but we'll see. This may be our longest show ever. So I'm Mike. And I'm Stomp. Let's get started. Hold on, we were going to do... I, I was waiting, we I knew missing. where you were going with that, Mike. I <laughs> yeah, was yeah, ready yeah, for yeah. that, right? Um, so we'll do this again. Do again. I'm Mike. I'm Stomp. I'm Mrs. Stomp. <laughs> <laughs> Tasha, go. Let's do this. Is that the next line? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get started. <laughs> uh, we want to do that again. Uh, we'll work on it. Oh, well, oh. we'll work on it. We'll work on it. Stomp, that's, edit that. Stomp. Do something with that, will you? excellent. All right. Hey, we tried. One more time with emotion. <laughs> exactly. So now on to beer talk here. Um, Tasha, what are you drinking? You, you mentioned you got something going on and, and you had to, Dan made you put it on a separate table. I have the same thing going on that I always have going on. Um, it's a finely crafted Corona Premier, 90 calories and uh, 2.6 carbs. It's, you know. Nice. Yeah. I like nice. those. And I actually, um, the, the reason why I like those for hiking specifically is that I use the water bladder. So I use that three liter water bladder <laughs> and I'll put ice and water in there and then slip the Corona in and it's like tall and narrow. So it fits in perfectly and stays nice and cold. I like it for hiking because it's kind of like drinking water. So you're actively hydrating mm-hmm. while you're enjoying a beverage. It's yeah, exactly. exactly. Wicked smart. Yes. <laughs> And uh, Mrs. Stomp, what do you got tonight? Anything good? Um, I've got some <laughs> vodka mixed with sugar-free ginger ale. <laughs> oh, I'll and mix vodka a, with anything. Yes. And I have a Frost Beer Works 
double IPA, and uh, I like Frost. They, they're really great. So basically, at the Campton Cupboard, if they don't have Erastus, which they've been pulling in from Schilling, um, I'll grab Frost because they're just delicious. Um, I don't think we've seen Reckless at the Cupboard. Nope. Yeah, it's like Reckless you can find in Plymouth and, and places distant to us. But um, yeah, Frost is awesome. So double IPA, a little sweeter than the old standard. I'm impressed, Stomp. Hey, I'm, I'm hooked. Yeah. yeah. What are you drinking, Mike? I'm clearing out my uh, my refrigerator, so I have the last of my smutty nose, which is old brown dog. So I think we bought these for my daughter's like high school graduation, like four months ago. It's been sitting in the back of the fridge, so yeah, it's cleared out. So that's it. Delicious. For the dr- the drinks and then uh, recent hikes. So, Stomp, have you been anywhere so- aside from um, the cooler, the fastest so- known time cooler? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, last night I did um, probably one of my most favorite memorable hikes recently. I did Welch Dickey and I showed up at 5 o'clock p.m., two cars in the parking lot, sun was setting just no people it was cool i mean it's like that moment you just wish for you know what i mean so i really hit it right on the mark and um i did the whole loop in hour 50 minutes so i was trying to push it a little bit i was a little inspired by the events over the weekend and uh it was a really nice time and i'm trying to talk mrs stomp into to grabbing it now you know we're trying to carve out a little time so we can do the same well sticky never never disappoints and uh to hit it like afternoon this time of the year is is the time like oh love it how about you mike yeah, you guys you guys are so lucky to be that close oh my god For me, yeah. it was just what you you had talked about so i did i went down Greeley pond and yeah. i did math and i was like okay i'm gonna meet these guys i'm gonna i'm gonna get up to timber camp come back down do Goodrich Rock, and then by the time I get out, because I'm so quick, I'll, they'll be like <laughs> right there, and I'll time it out perfectly. They passed me like I didn't; I was too slow. So I went up to basically I just parked at Livermore with you, went to that intersection off of Livermore, went down Greeley Pond, yeah, and then did the Timber Camp, which you've talked about a few times. That's great. Um, yeah, that's really and then nice. Came back down so i kind of redlined a little bit so i came back down Greeley and then went to good good rich rock and i would say good rich rock is now on my list like people will ask like what's a good hike for kids or what's a a good hike to get started with to sort of like get a feel for what it, what it's like i think good rich is one of those those hikes that you can really recommend to people with kids especially if you've got like a high energy kid that wants to go out, like it's really fascinating to see the the glacial erratics. I think they call them. It's these sure. huge boulders, right? That have been pushed out there. It's just unbelievable. There's like probably and they're like massive. Of them. Yeah, yeah. So is it below Goodrich, there's a field, correct? Of there's a, a particular name for a field of erratics, and then you get to Goodrich after the fact. I don't recall the name. But. Yeah, it's something. I think it begins with a B. But you're right. Like about a half a mile up the trail is where you start getting to see those giant boulders, and then you go maybe about a quarter mile, a little bit after that is where you finally get to Goodrich Rock. But like from that boulder field all the way up to Goodrich is like just endless amounts of these giant boulders, and one of them shaped like a, a, a ship. When mm-hmm. you look at it, it literally looks like. It looks like the ship from Goonies when you look at it from the front. It's it's pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I'm glad you made it up there. Um, yeah. Awesome time. Timber Camp is cool, too, because you get to look over the Greeley Cliffs and the southeastern side of East Osceola, which is really an interesting rock. It's like a half dome. Yeah, super yeah, cool. Yeah, I think, and I, th- I think that we were talking about this when we were carrying the coolers, is my impression was like <laughs> Timber Camp, like stop at the part where there's like the open gravel field and then climb up that and take a look don't keep going although i guess if you're tracing then you got kind of got to keep going but yeah if you keep going to the end all it is is basically like a high school party spot it's just like an open field with a with a fire pit and there's nothing really there sure but the vibe is is not new hampshire it's like a western vibe out there it's yeah, very yeah, different yeah. it's neat yeah, yeah it is so um 
but that's good. So Tasha, you you and Dan been anywhere good recently? Uh, Dan and I most recently we were camping up on the Saco with some friends, and they were planning to float the river, and I wasn't going to be up there and not hike a mountain. So we were going to do Eastman, and like most of my hikes, I never hike what I actually planned to hike. We got into Evans Notch, and we completely changed our mind, and we were like, "What's this Caribou Mountain?" and uh, we decided to do that instead and we were just blown away it was just an amazing super cool like trail but just the views up there were just absolutely stunning like evans notch just never disappoints you can't go up there and come away like well that was a bad day like it's always just gorgeous amazing views so that was that was our most recent adventure together Huh. Yeah, it's just like those ledges go on forever, yes. and it's such like a gradual, awesome hike. Like it doesn't matter what direct, if whether you clockwise or counterclockwise. Like that caribou is amazing. So you guys made made the right choice. I would take that over Eastman any day. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. So we have uh, two notable hikes. Um, Brando six twenty four did thirteen out of forty eight with young Tyler. He's a young man who's uh, diving into hiking. And it was Tom Field Willie. So uh, Tyler, congrats! Keep up the good work. And then I got a, a message from Mike, another Mike, and um, he was up on Algonquin Trail and came by an area of charred forest. So I was getting really nervous uh, that somebody was maybe committing some arson or whatever but sent the information to uh, either Forest Service or Fishing Game I think it was Forest Service and they just said you know it was probably a lightning strike so <laughs> that's pretty interesting yeah um, so there you go it's time for Slasher's Guest of the Week very cool very cool Alright, well, we're moving on to our first segment here. So we're going to welcome Tasha and then we're going to talk about hiking etiquette and then end it with hiking with dogs. And then we're going to go into the next segment, which is talking about your book, Tasha. So I think just to start off with, um, I'll try to tee this up and then stomp if you want to add anything before Tasha introduces herself. But um, we had Susie and Alvaro on a couple of weeks ago and talked about sort of how we met how we, we were able to uh, to meet them through hiking. And I think, Tasha, you were sort of in the mix with that whole group of friends that we've met early on when I think the Stomps probably met you before I did. But, um, you know, you're married also to a friend uh, of ours, Dan. And, you know, we've been in the same sort of hiking Facebook groups and work living in the same universe for probably the last, like, six or seven years. And then... You know, we started this dumb podcast, and when we were talking about <laughs> Hannah Dustin, like you would reach, and I knew this in my head, but I had totally forgotten. Like, and you would reach out, and you were like, "Hey, I'm writing. The, I wrote the book about Hannah," and I was like, "Oh my god, we have to get you on." So that's sort of how um, this came about. And I don't know, Stomp, is there anything else I'm missing? Not really. Yeah, I think. Um, I mean, Tasha and I probably know each other from some of the early hiking groups and this and that, and. Yeah, blossom from there. But I've never met you in person, Tasha. Yeah, we've actually never met. This never. Is the closest to meeting in person that we've actually come. Yeah. yeah I've met yeah. Mrs. Stomp a few times, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Because we all went to, um, what was the place in Red Portsmouth? The, the Red, Red Hook. Hook. Yeah, we were there. That I don't night, know if that so. was like a our Christmas party, maybe. We all used to kind of get together been. for different, you know, camps. For hooligans? Or, yeah, I think we, we it was in the winter. I know it was cold out, but okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I actually, I think that's where I met Mrs. Stomp and uh, you, Mike. See. And yeah. all of us. The funny thing is that like we're all part of this hiking group, but it doesn't necessarily mean that any of us have met each other ever. Maybe <laughs> we've we've gone on a hike together, and yeah. like this whole this whole group of people comes together, and like honestly, the first like twenty minutes until like the couple first beers kick in like was a little awkward we're all kind of like nervous and shy and like oh hey yeah I've, I've met you I saw what you posted or I know you did this hike but then you know after a little bit you warm up and feels like family yeah, yeah. you're yeah. like oh, everyone, totally everyone's like you're much more quiet in, in real life than you are on social media That's, I remember Mike you being especially kind of nervous seated, <laughs> like quietly sitting there and, yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah like did I insult any of these people oh boy <laughs> So, great. Well, Tasha, so why don't you introduce yourself, talk a little bit about your your background, um, specific to hiking, sort of early on in your life, how you got into it, and then sort of 
the 4,000 footers and any other pursuits that you're currently doing right now? Yeah. Um, so it's kind of funny that I ever ended up a hiker because as a kid and as a teenager and even to my 20s, I like absolutely hated hiking. I grew up in Guilford, New Hampshire, and for any of the listeners that doesn't know where that is that's one of the towns that contain the Belknap range and our teachers would like drag us up these mountains all the time and uh. they would they sent us out once we'd read to build a fire and they literally sent a bunch of us seventh graders out like no proper gear with I don't know six matches whatever the story has in it I don't remember I read it in seventh grade like <laughs> to try to build a fire in the middle of winter like I get sent back with hypothermic symptoms like it was just <laughs> Oh, terrible geez. experiences and I, as an adult I look back and I'm like well that's really cool these adults these teachers put these this effort into making these cool experiences and I just hated it I like moved out west in my 20s lived in Colorado my partner at the time always wanted to take me hiking and I was just in fear like I was I thought a mountain lion was going to eat me all the time I just I hated I hated hiking I loved I loved animals and I loved the woods but like I just didn't want to be in danger and that's what hiking felt like to me and fast hmm. forward to 2016 my best friend nicole and i we are running a yoga studio and we're all into like you know fitness and health and i started kind of like bumming around in the woods a little bit locally and joining some facebook groups and i saw a picture of what turned out to be adams and i was like what is this place this looks like magic i need to know and i called nicole it's like hey there's this thing called the 48 and we're gonna do it and she's like yeah okay i'm in so we just <laughs> We just started hiking. We started, you know, showing up to like Liberty and Flume in our little yoga cotton hiking shorts with like fanny packs and a cliff bar and, and very quickly learned uh, a whole lot about what we actually were facing and what what we needed to get for gear. And here, here I am now, six years later. Yeah, I'm pretty soon you started to meet people. Um, did you, how quickly did you complete the 4,000 footers? We did the 4,000 footers in just under a year. Just under a year. And then from the time you started till the time you ended, can you talk about your network? Like, did you meet people during the 4,000 footers or was it mostly afterwards? Um, initially, we didn't meet a lot of people, uh, not not because of Nicole, because of me. Like, I'm a little bit antisocial when it comes to meeting strangers. Uh, she was always like, we should invite this person. I was like, no, I don't need any new friends. Like, no, no, no. And then through, you know, the, the hiking groups, we started to, like, casually talk with some people. And we started having some, like, messages with Gina, with Susie. And I remember Nicole invited Gina and Susie to come on our um, our Carter's hike. And I was like, I can't believe you did this to me, Nicole. Like, I actually have to, like, meet a stranger. And then Gina and Susie show up. And they're fantastic. And, you know, we have a blast and, like, start, like, a really solid, great friendship forever. But that was towards, that was actually kind of towards the end of our hiking, um, the 48. So primarily, it was just Nicole and myself, uh, Nicole trying to, like, cheerily meet people on trail and me being like Shh, don't talk to strangers until we uh made that jump to meet up with Susie and and gina that one day got it and then can you talk about like what are some of your favorite hikes and then what are you sort of what's your perspective on hiking now uh, i'm assuming you're similar to me where you can sort of just you just hike whatever but can, can you talk a little bit about sort of favorite hikes yeah. and, and what you get planned for the future I think that question has stressed me out the most. Like, what they're going to ask me what my favorite hikes are. And um, everyone that's done the 48 and, like, applied for the patch knows that you have to write a trail report about one of your hikes. When that came to me, I wrote a trail report on every single hike. Every single one, I wrote, like, a trail report. I handed them, like, this huge, this manuscript <laughs> is what I sent in for my patch. Because I just couldn't choose. Because, like, every single hike... Whether it was a complete shit mountain like hail, something cool happened on, something memorable to me, or some funny thing uh, occurred, totally. or yeah, so it's really it's tough something. for me to like pick. Um, <laughs> but I did. I took some notes and I, I did pick some. Um, isolation, huge favorite of mine via Glen Boulder. It's just an amazing climb up. Uh, Rocky Rocky Branch is absolute crap. I hate Rocky Branch. I'm on but it that is, page. It is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. instead of That's regaining exactly all that elevation. Yeah. it's When we did it, it was like, is this a river or is this trail? Like, what is happening here? And a, <laughs> a trail has never earned its name more than Rocky Branch. Like, all those roots and rocks. And it was just terrible. But Glen Boulder <laughs> and isolation itself, just absolutely beautiful views. Fantastic. 
Um, I'm a big fan of Whiteface. Blueberry Ledge, I think, is a great time. Um, mm. It makes you feel like you should be scared, but it's never really scary. Like, you get yeah. that, like, ooh, if I went over there, that could be bad, but you would never go over there <laughs> because the trail's right here, so you just go this way, but you get that little excitement. Um, and then the Bald Faces, once again, Evans Notch. Like, I, I'm just never going to have a bad day in Evans Notch. I mean, I had, I, I agree that the Bald Faces should be on the T25. I found some spots climbing up pretty terrifying dan laughed at me a lot when we did those together uh but yeah um and as of right now i was like a hardcore list girl like my life i had the list on my fridge i had a piece of wood that like painted like every mountain i hiked and i have i have like a notebook with like every possible list and and i was like obsessed with this and then COVID happened and we all got that report like stay low stay local stay low stay local and everything in hiking kind of shifted for me and i started to have to have to spend my time like in the bell naps i'm i'm in dover new hampshire so the bell naps are like 45 to like an hour 20 for me and my perspective kind of started to change a little bit whereas now i just want to hike what i want to hike i want to hike for a good view i want to hike for a good time i don't necessarily want to go do this hike that just sucks and i don't want to do it but i got to do it to check this box so I like Dan and I did caribou as I said but last week I went and hiked Mount Major because Mount Major has a fantastic freaking view no matter like what we want to joke about the parking lot being full and people parked up and down the road it's a great view up there and I really love the section you know when you get up and it starts to flatten out it almost has like a, a west vi- out west vibe and there's some fun like rocks and so I'm, I'm just trying to enjoy mountains and not force myself to necessarily accomplish something now and just go out and look at some clouds yeah that's my my big thing now is like i've tr- I've noticed i've transitioned to like these like let me see if i can get a really cool hike in but but let me be able to leave massachusetts on a sunday morning at 5 a.m but be home by noontime so i can cook you know i can cook dinner or whatever so it's exactly. like shorter hikes more quality so um all right, so then the only other thing I wanted to, so I want to get into this male-female dynamic stuff because there's been st- things blowing up on social media, but you and Dan met through hiking, so do you want to tell that story now? We, we did. So Dan and I met on the Tri-Pyramids. It was actually, well, while I was doing my 48, he'd already completed his, and that Carter's Day, I was mentioning that I met Susie and Gina, and uh, it was an absolute shit show day. It was like freezing rain, absolute misery, one of the worst days I've ever spent in the woods, condition-wise. And that week, we'd also planned to hike the tries. And we show up, and it starts raining, and all three of us were like, F this. Like, never again, never again in these conditions. So I played with Gina. I'm like, you know what? I'll just catch up with you on Saturday, and we can hike it. And she created a group going um but i wasn't able to start when they were starting just mostly because i don't like starting that early so i was like i'll go up pine bend you guys do the slide and i'll start later and meet you up there well i get up there and i spend a very very long time waiting on the summit because you know the slide's vastly different than pine bend and uh by the time they get up there i'll admit i may have had a beverage or two by then and and i'd already gone over and done the other peak and i was like all right somebody who's done that one hang out with me um because i'm not going back over and dan volunteered and we hung out and chatted while you know they went over and grabbed the other peak and then um when we were this is very romantic guys any hikers will really appreciate this when we started to go down dan looked at me and said do you want to run down this mountain together and i was like (laughs) absolutely and uh we ran down the mountain and then my gosh, a month and a half later, I think I moved in. A year later, we were married, and next week we're celebrating our five-year wedding anniversary. So, wow, that's our, our mountain story. <laughs> Super cool. Slasher's hiking topic of the week. Wow. Well, that is a perfect segue into the topic that we want to cover here. So there's something that Dan did that did not freak you out on trail, which is right now there's been a lot of talk on social media about like there's been like six or seven separate posts around like the dynamic that you see on trail. Like, I mean, me and Stompa, we've talked about this with like a number of different guests, like when you're interacting with people that you're you're passing on trail, generally what you want to just do is say, hi, how you doing? Nice day. 
great views or whatever. But for some reason, there seems to be this thing going on where people are interacting with each other in a way that is perceived as off-putting, particularly like from, there's a number of female posters that have basically said like, I feel like I'm being like talked down to by men on trail or I'm being mansplained or people are offering up information that I didn't ask for and I feel like the reason they're doing that is because I'm a woman and they wouldn't treat a man the same way and there's this default assumption that I don't know what I'm doing out there and you know there's there's been all kinds of comments about it and I think in general and again Stomp hates this topic so uh, well, it's, I, uh, it's the framing I don't think it's yeah. exclusively a gender topic I think yeah. it's there are other factors but continue yeah yeah and you're right like generally there's certain people that just like to give advice unsolicited exactly yeah it's 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 coming off negatively and there's a sort of a male female dynamic so i used to hear this very early on and i think tasha and mrs snob like you our whole friend group was when i started hearing about this and i had never considered it before but I've also heard it from like my other friends like Beth Lynn and Mindy have talked about it and I've heard it from other people around the fact that like there is this sensitivity around um, you know we're equals we're out there doing the same thing that everybody else is like we don't need any sort of coaching or advice if we don't ask for it so um, there's been enough chatter on social media I figured with Tasha, with you coming on and now Mr. Stomps here, I thought it would be interesting to sort of get your perspective. Like, is this a real thing? Are people being overly sensitive? Or is this something that happens a lot that we're just not aware of because we're dudes? Well, I guess I'd ask you guys first, how many times has somebody stopped you on trail and asked you, like, if you had the proper gear, if you know the weather conditions? Do you know, like, how, how frequently does somebody do that to you guys? Can I be honest with you? Several yeah, times. Well, totally. Several, Several times. Several times. And I can tell you right in my backyard, coming down Welch, people assume you're an idiot for going down Welch as opposed to going counterclockwise, you know, towards Dickey. I get it all the time from women, from men. It, there's just this, per, you know, in this idea, which Mike and I have touched upon, where you shouldn't do certain trails in a certain direction, whether it's falling waters or other th- trails. So, I've got my 60 pound pack. I've got my boots. I'm coming down Welch and, and people call me out on it regardless of my 30 plus years of experience. So yeah, I get it. Oh, all right. I did. So that's why I come, that's why I come at this in terms of like there being other factors and reasons for people to approach you in a, you know, inquisitive or caring or whatever the motivation or intent uh, manner. So yeah, it is interesting. Yeah, I've never, um, no one's really ever given me unsolicited advice. Dude, it's because you're so, going too fact, fast. <laughs> you're just Probably, too fast. Like, I, do, I actually get people that have asked me questions before, which I'm happy to answer. But, you know, Tosh, I've never gotten anybody give me any, anything like that. I think one of the best examples, like, over the, I, I kind of actually try to talk to some of my friends. I was like, anybody got any stories they want to share? And they're like, there's just, there's like just too many. Like, I just blow them off and forget about them. But one thing I was, I, I recently I went up and I was going to hike Pierce. I got there and it was like kind of windy and I, I didn't prepare gear for that kind of wind. I was like, oh, screw this. I'm just going to go over to Willard. And so my day ended a little shorter and I'm like, let's be touristy. I've never done it. I'm going to go hit Ripley Falls on the way out because I've got some extra time. And I'm hiking out there and all of a sudden this guy comes up to, he's hiking, you know, towards me and he goes, well, aren't you brave to be out here all alone? And I, I kind of like looked side to side, like, is this dude talking to me? Like, mm-hmm. and, and he goes, oh, you're not alone. I see your groups back there. And I looked and there were some people. I was like, yeah, no, I'm alone. That's not my group. And just kept going. This is Ripley Falls. Like you bring your kids in Crocs and it's like a mile. And I'm like, I'm a brave little lady. That's like what I felt like. I was like, get out of here, dude. So it's like in situations like that's like, seriously, like no one needs advice there. No one needs to be like, good job you girl so i definitely felt it i I don't think he would have said that to a six foot two dude coming in to look at ripley falls i just don't think he'd be like you're a brave little boy and good job um so was he trying to make make the moves i you know i didn't get that vibe (laughs) i didn't i didn't really pick up that vibe 
<laughs> do you um and i remember like i have like uh, i think i talked to beth lynn who's been on the show before and i've hiked with her like i got the she told me a story and she was sort of like like i felt like she held on to it like it kind of ruined her day like when that stuff happens like does it ruin your day or are you just sort of like all right it's a five or ten minute thing and i'm over it okay and does it it doesn't ruin my day i'm i just mostly think like oh yeah all right asshole and and then i go finish whatever my hike is you know I don't, I don't, and then I go, I generally go post about it and make a joke about it on Facebook, you know, but it doesn't, well, that, it doesn't hurt my feelings, oh. but. I just want to comment that in reference to what you said, Mike, about this recently blowing up, there was, you know, a couple posts like, why do people have to go post about these things and just like, is that necessary? Or if. If this is an issue with somebody on trail, why can't you have a conversation with this person and dig into it and say, "What's what, why do you ask? I mean, I just get a kick out of these people that just post these gigantic, you know, essays about this experience and, you know, okay. I feel like my best guess on that, and I, again, I've talked to some of my friends about this, is I think at the time that things happen sometimes, like you don't react in the way that you feel like you should have react. Like you, you have regret. And then from there, you sort of like, you think like, oh, wish I wish I had really s- stood up to that situation more than I did. And maybe that's the outlet. I, I don't know, Tasha, what do, what do you think? That's interesting. Um, I think that social media can be a really negative thing. And I think we've all experienced that. But I also think it has a positive side where you can get some information out if people are willing to listen. So I think if you go on to a group like the 4K group, or I think the post, the most recent post we're talking about was, and you kind of go like, hey, look, here's some information. Just my perspective. And you're kind of getting it out there for a wider audience of people that might listen and go, oh yeah, I didn't, I never thought about that. Makes them consider and maybe makes them kind of question themselves the next time if they were the type of person that would offer unsolicited advice readily they might kind of go oh i remember what that girl said on that facebook post i made Mm -hmm. maybe maybe not i think that that perhaps was the poster's intention Hmm. yeah what do you say to there's just certain people that are extreme extroverts that just have to have a conversation with people you know we've all run into them on trail like what's What's the best approach? Like I, I sort of have on my notes here, like the safest thing you can do is to just sort of say hello and move on. But you can also sort of make a comment about weather or com- commiserate about trail conditions. And I think those are pretty safe to just talk about if you need to. But is there any any other ideas around like what's what's a safe topic when you're coming by somebody? I think how much longer do is till the top is a great conversation piece. How much longer? Say 15 minutes. No. Tell me 15 minutes. Like, Don't uh, ever ask Stomp that question. He'll be like, you're almost there. And then we pass them and I'm like, uh, you're fucking lying to them. All, all, hi- all hikers are liars. That's one of the truest statements I think there is. But no, I mean, like, I have no problem with a person like stopping on trail and being like, Hey, how you doing? Like, oh, what, what, the, what were the views like? I, I want to have those conversations. I enjoy my time in the woods and the people that share the woods with me. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think that uh, sticking to the basic topics. What's the weather? What's the wind like? How are the views? Are those skies that they clear? You know, things like that and not really imposing your opinions on another person while in the woods. Oh, see, the... Th- this is. I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's uh, such a deep topic. Topic because everybody's experience is so different. Like, you know, um, I may come across somebody wearing, say, flip flops and you know a, a tee that should not be at 4K. Um, other people may perceive that person differently based upon their experience. So it's very, it's a very. It is really. It is really it's subjective and ob- objective, and yeah. I guess in my brain, in this particular issue, uh, the women that are speaking out about this probably aren't showing up in flip-flops. These are the women that have got a full gear, all the proper equipment on. They're clearly prepared for a day in the woods, and they're still receiving this kind of advice. Like, Mm -hmm. vastly different than a situation where you look at a person and you're like, whoa, dude, you are not prepared at all for what you're going to see in another thousand feet of gain. That that becomes some kind of a, a moral, you know, obligation of like safety for another human being this is this isn't what i don't i don't think this is what these girls are talking about 
Yeah. Have you ever, though, come across someone on the tri slide and flip flops top? I was like, <laughs> yes, what? actually, I, I have come across a person on the tri slide and flip flops. Um, Just saying. When, when I hike in my chacos, I take my boots with me in my bag and I like to Jesus. challenge myself. I sometimes I've done some barefoot hiking, but this is all with the, uh, the full knowledge that like this is what I'm trying to do. And I have I have all the gear with me to. Uh, if it's not going to be plausible to switch up, that was pretty badass, places. by the way. I I still have those chacos. Chacos <laughs> are the best sandals. Here's a plug for chacos. Those <laughs> things can get you up the tri slide and last like five years later. <laughs> are those those um like those flip flops with like the um, the strings around the ankle? Like is that what like the the um the the running guy from no, Mexico? No, no. I wish I. I I'm in Dan's office. Text so. Dan. Text Dan. Get up Dan, here with right. my chacos. <laughs> Bring my dirty chacos in here. Um, I'll pull it up on the yeah, show notes. Just, just Google chacos, and I just wear like the, the the they have like ones that are like the Tevas, but I just wear the thong ones. They've got some good tread on the bottom, <laughs> and okay. they can they can take you places. <laughs> All right. Well, if yeah, I see you on the trail in that thing, I'm pulling out a red card and saying, "Ma'am, <laughs> <laughs> let me mansplain." Did your you wear those hair. the day you and Dan met? Is that what got I, them that day? I no, but I, I think I sealed the deal when I wore them for the tri slide. Yeah, you did. That, yeah, that was that was it. Um, so, Tasha, when you're solo hiking and you see a dude coming up behind you or coming towards you, what are some things that we can do to sort of set you in? First of all, like, I feel like I would be more scared of you than you would of me on the trail because I feel like you could beat me up. But um, in general, like, what's some advice that you could you could give people to sort of um, set, set people at ease in, the, in those situations because I do hear that a lot too that like people get freaked out about dudes coming at them on the trail I, I, I can't say that I'm part of that group of people that get nervous about dudes on trail um, I get more nervous about like dudes walking around my local flat areas you know in the woods out here in Dover than I would like I, I don't really think somebody is hiking up to 3,000, 4,000 feet for any other reason but to hike that mountain like i'm not i'm not generally concerned about my physical safety or well-being when i'm out there i have perhaps an over sense of trust for my fellow hikers and i don't think that any any dudes out there to purposefully make me uncomfortable in any way um so but for the what you're talking about i think just acknowledge your fellow hikers on trail say hey how how's how you doing yeah let me get out i'll move out of the way just this just act like a normal human being general typical conversation you have as you're passing somebody by and yeah that makes sense and i would say my advice for people like if you are somebody that like just you see somebody on trail and you really need to you feel like you need to say something to them about whatever my approach to that would be, and I usually don't say anything to anybody. I say, hi, how you doing? And I'll tell a story. I did try to interact with a lady on trail <laughs> this weekend, and it went horribly wrong. And I'll tell the story in a minute. But generally, um, if I feel like, okay, I do want to open up a conversation, I always start with the, you know, hey, the weather, the trail's great. I'll, and then I'll ask people a question, just like you said, Tosh. I'll be like, you know, oh, how much longer is it to here? Or... You know, have you ever hiked this trail before? What's it like? What should I expect? Or I'll ask them a gear question and say like, oh, how do you like that backpack? I was thinking about like maybe buying it or whatever. And sometimes it's bullshit and it's just to open up a discussion. Um, but I think that's my advice is like if you really want to start prying on things, do it in a way that's like super sneaky so they don't know that you're going to hit them with like some advice or whatever. Spoken like a true extrovert. Like I would <laughs> never do that. I just, I, I when I see people, I say, morning, end of story, <laughs> move on. That's it. I never yeah. look for conversation. Never. That's well, really interesting. On Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> So <laughs> Saturday, I was like, I was thinking about this topic, and I was like, I think when did I message you? Did I message you a Saturday morning, Tasha? Right? I, that sounds to, about right. Yeah. To lo- yeah. So I was sort of thinking about the whole topic as well. So I, I was on Greeley Pond, <laughs> heading down solo, and the one cool thing about Greeley Pond is that there was a bunch of these like spider webs that were like perfectly circular spider webs, and I, I don't see those on trail that often, so. I don't know what I, I was like taking a picture of the spider web 
and a lady came by and I was sort of like, all right, well, I'm going to make small talk. So, and she sort of stumbled upon me while I was taking the picture. So I said, hey, good morning. How are you? She's an older lady. She had like a wooden hiking stick or whatever. And um, she's like, hi. And then I was like, oh, there's a lot of spider webs on this trail. It's pretty cool. And and she's like, I'm from Florida. We have a lot of spiders. <laughs> and I was just like, okay, bye. <laughs> and that was it. And that's New Englanders are supposed to be rude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's and she kept walking, and I was like, okay, from Florida. Uh, that went horribly wrong, but okay. <laughs> so don't let it dissuade you from trying to talk to somebody else again, Mike. Yeah, I was going to explain to her how cool spider webs were. Well, Mike, she saw me earlier sitting there in the middle of nowhere with a bunch of coolers. So she was probably <laughs> off. She was being a little protective. Like, yeah, who's this yeah, psycho like, with all the coolers? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So anyway, so I don't think we solved any problems here. The other thing, Tasha, I guess I would say is that like for guys, there was a fair amount of guys sort of commenting being like, you know, you got to let it go or you're being overly sensitive or whatever. And what I would say is that the one thing that, you, you know, if I weren't friends with you guys or I wasn't exposed to, even my daughter tells me like, you know, dad, you don't need to mansplain things. So I've gotten a lot of exposure <laughs> to people that have a different perspective. If you haven't like hiked with, if you're a guy and you're looking at this stuff and saying like people are being too sensitive, but you've never hiked with female hikers or you haven't talked to them about this stuff, like have a conversation and don't assume because sometimes you don't know, like people have been sexually assaulted. They've been physically hit. You know, everybody has their own sort of history with this stuff. So some people's tolerance is going to be very different than other people's. So absolutely. Yeah. I think that's very valid. Um, Women's Hiking Group, I know you guys have talked about that before. I can remember years ago, there was a a hike plan that they were getting together, some kind of women's only class or course or something. And I kind of was a little sarcastically like, why are we, why are we doing this women's only thing? Like, what's, why do we have to do this? Like, I kind of err towards the, let's, let's not have women's only or men's only. Let's just all hike together. And somebody came on and they were like, Tasha, you have to realize that not every woman is comfortable in the presence of men. As you were saying, Mike, they, there's, there can be some history that could create a situation where a woman wouldn't, wouldn't attend something if she felt that she could be in any kind of jeopardy or any kind of discomfort because of the presence of a guy. So that's super important. What you just said, we always have to remember that like our own experiences are not the experiences of other people and that could yeah. Yep. really affect Fair somebody's enough. reaction to different interactions on trail. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, so just, I think we'll put a pin in this, and then uh, we do want to move on quickly to your perspective on hiking with dogs. So can you give us your animal ownership resume for my, a second? My resume? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so when I started doing the 48 and really started, um, you know, hiking, I only had one dog, and he was a 13-year-old, 90-pound, big big boy. Um, I brought him on some stuff like Flat Mountain Pond, things like that, but I never once took him on a 4K. Um, he was just big dog that age. It's not a good mix. Um, shortly after I started the 4K, I got my dog, Kaya. She's a little pit mix. And when Dan and I got together, he had Molly. And we both have had very different experiences with hiking with dogs, where I, I shied away from bringing um, Kaya on hikes, uh, where Dan brought Molly on every single one. Like, I think Molly finished her 48 just shortly after I finished my 48. Um, and she's a tremendous trail dog. Um, my view on it is that you have to remember if you're bringing your dog into the woods, that you are responsible for the dog's safety and well-being. Uh, you have to be prepared to carry that dog out if that dog gets injured. A dog can break a leg just as easily as a human can break a leg, and you have to be prepared. I know you guys have talked about pack a paws on here. I have one of those. If my dogs are going to go on a hike with me, that's in my pack. Um, we've been in a situation before, pre when I learned about the pack a paws, where we were up on Mount Height with just Molly. We didn't bring Kaya. Um, and Molly has done all the 48. She's a tremendous hiking dog. She hiked in the winter. Something happened with her, and she her paws were just too cold. She refused to move. She wouldn't go any further. And we literally, I say we, Dan literally had to pick her up and carry her and just get her, like, down. We just had to, like, bail, change our whole plan for the hike. We were going to do all the carters, and it was like, no, we just got to get her down. So I just think 
obviously dogs love being outside. They, they want to and people want to adventure with their animals. But I just think you need to be as prepared for everything you're prepared for for you, for your animal as well when you're out there. Yeah, that makes sense. And yeah. I feel like um, it's probably a good idea. Like if you're if you're chasing a list, like it's probably not the greatest idea to be to be taking your dog along if you've got that list fever because you're not always thinking in terms of like the best safety for the the dog so it's almost like do the list first and then take the dog and then because you're not going to care as much if you don't make that summit right exactly i can definitely say that during my 48 i pushed on in worse conditions than i should have worse trail conditions weather conditions and I would not have wanted to have my dog there because when I went out for the 48, I, I went out to summit and it was an extremely hard thing for me to ever turn around. And I would never want to put my dog in that situation mm-hmm. ever. Leash, no leash training. How do you, how do you get them to the point where they can either be off leash safely or you train them with a leash where it's not like miserable for you? I, th- I think you have different types of dogs. So in our home, we have Molly, the hiking dog, and we have Kaya, the city dog. Molly has excellent recall. Dan trained her and she comes. You say Molly, she's there. Uh, a red squirrel could maybe make that a little more difficult, but <laughs> she listens. Kaya... Kaya came to me at six years old um, with very little training and as hard as we've worked, Kaya doesn't have recall. So Kaya needs to be on a leash, not only because she could chase off and like when I let her off leash and she chased a deer after a nine mile hike and I had to go chasing off into the woods to find her, but also because she's afraid of things like thunderstorms, gunshots, and she'll take off running. So you got to know your dog and some dogs like Kaya need to be on a leash and you have to take that into consideration of what trails you're picking. I had... I've learned this the hard way. I had Kaya. I was doing Pasacana Way 2016. If you guys remember, that was like the year of ice. There was oh, like no snow on any trail. Yep. I didn't I ice didn't even queen. think that it snowed in the whites. I, that was my first year of hiking in the whites. Oh. I, was like, I guess it's just ice. Like I, we, <laughs> I never put on a snowshoe. I hiked in spikes and crampons the whole time. And uh, I brought Kaya and Nicole brought her husky, both dogs that required leashes. And we were just trying to navigate down these trails of glaciers with these dogs that needed to be on leash and it was miserable and I think it's experiences like that that make me really go all right I, I, I'm very careful about what I pick what weather what season what type of trail when I bring my dogs um, so leash or not leash back to that direct answer um, if your dog doesn't have recall it needs to be leashed for a multi- multitude of reasons there could be another dog on trail that is leashed because it's dog aggressive and if your dog can't be recalled, now you've got a, a dog fight in the middle of the woods, and that's not a pretty sight. So, in your opinion, like I, I follow, like I have a, you know a bunch of friends on Instagram, and some people I met, like Corey is the one that comes to mind to me yeah. the most. Like, how rare is it that you get a dog like Molly, or you get dogs like Corey's dogs? Like, is that? something that's reasonably common or when you see those pictures of those dogs that are so well behaved and such great mountain dogs is that just a really rare thing that people need to understand that like the amount of time and effort that people have put into training is not something that's normal um i'm not i I can't claim to be an expert on that exact answer but that exact question but my answer for it would be it is time and it is effort i think um Dan brought Molly out every single weekend. You see Corey, she's out every single weekend. It's time spent with these dogs on trail and off trail training. Dan didn't just go, let's see if Molly can have recall and let her off the leash. Like he trained her to be able to go out and do these things. Got it. And then can you talk about your cats? Do you have cats? Yes, I can definitely talk about my cats. Um, I didn't like cats uh, at all. And Dan had a cat when we got together, and sadly, he had, he, <laughs> look, <laughs> hi, baby kitty. Uh, sadly, Dan's kitty had passed away, and he really, really wanted another cat, and I really, really wanted to not have babies. So I offered that I would let him get a cat if he got a vasectomy. So that's how we ended up with first kitty. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> and, and first kitty was supposed to be Dan's kitty. Like, I didn't want it. I was like, I'm not changing a litter ball. I'm not, I, this is this is for you. And then she attached mm-hmm. to me. So then I fell in love with this kitty. And then um, 
a library patron posts a little box of kittens and one of them kind of looks like Big Kitty and then we end up with Pippy Kitty and then last Christmas we were at PetSmart and there was Cute Kitty and then we ended up with Coco Kitty and I've kind of <laughs> become a crazy cat lady and uh, I'm, I'm pushing for a boy and I think I can win Dan over because he's the only boy in the house. We have chickens that are girls, all of our cats are girls, all of our dogs are girls, me. So I'm thinking I can like get to four cats if it's a boy cat. I don't know. This is unbelievable. Stomp, have we ever had a guest that doesn't have a cat or multiple cats? I don't think we've ever had a guest that doesn't have a cat. Uh, Ty Gagney. Ty? Ty is allergic. I think Mindy doesn't yeah, have a cat either. She was <laughs> Ty was allergic. I remember that episode. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. He was, was he at your house actually He recording? was in yeah. the studio yes, and the cats were just all like yeah. all over the place. Yeah. It was too much. Oh, so funny. All right. <laughs> Let's dive into some White Mountains history, shall we? All right, so now we're going to move on to segment two here, which is uh, the book that you've written, Tasha. So I think I'm going to set the stage here, and then we'll ask you a bunch of questions. So we're going to go back in time to the late 1600s, but even before then, I'm going to try to set the stage. So as this relates to it, this is kind of a hiking related it's sort of like just history related about what's going on Regional. in the late 1600s and we'll weave in a little bit about the white mounts as well but if you go back to 1642 darby field was the first person that had ascended mount washington so he lived in and around where you're sitting right now tasha where i think he lived in either portsmouth or dover or something like that and when he ascended mount washington he basically made his way up the coast to the Saco River and then followed the Saco from the ocean all the way up into the mountains with the goal of reaching the, the highest summit. It's unclear whether or not he actually ascended through the Montalban Range and came up through isolation in that area or whether he might have actually come in through... Um, you know, the dry river and maybe even Crawford Path. So we don't know. What we do know is that he certainly had assistance with um, Native Americans. And at that, around that time, in the early 1600s to the mid 1600s, there was a generally a much more cordial relationship than there was if you fast forward another, say, 25 to 30 years. You had the beginning, I think, the first phase of. Um, the Indian Wars, and you had what's called the Dummer War, and even like the settlement of Conway, New Hampshire, and uh, the Belknap Expedition, which is sort of like the first documented expedition of, of Mount Washington, um, happened in the early 1700s. So there's just a lot of like, it, it, basically you're talking frontier land, like this is like as far into the frontier as you can in New Hampshire, but even if you take a step back going into like the Merrimack River in Massachusetts, you know, there was some settlements in Dover, Portsmouth and that area, but that was really the frontier line there. So can you talk a little bit about that, Tasha, and sort of like what were these people's lives like back in that time? And then, you know, we'll, we'll get into sort of a little bit of the background on you know, what motivated you to write the book. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm really glad you said something, um, which was that initially... Um, there were alliances made. The relationship between the early settlers and the Native Americans wasn't wasn't nasty. It wasn't the you know Thanksgiving story that we are given in elementary school, of course, but um, it was a lot more positive than we kind of talk about it now. Uh, we we kind of have a rhetoric that um, we stole this land, and and our the early settlers. I'm, I'm talking like pilgrims. They 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 didn't. They came and they bought land. And the problem was that uh, we had a different understanding between settlers and Native Americans what land purchase meant. Uh, land purchase to a family from England meant I own this land. I put a fence around this land. You don't come on this land unless you have permission. Land sale to a Native American meant more like land usage. You can build, and yes, you can do this, but when it comes time to harvest those nuts that fall from the trees, I get to come back on this land. And other practices, like Native Americans didn't keep livestock. 
settlers did, and they didn't keep them in the best possible ways. They had what they had their pigs. They let them roam free, which trashed the shores and all the shellfish. They would get into Indian crops, and it really started to like badden the blood between Native Americans and and the settlers. And uh, instead of trying to fix that, settlers made rules like, all right, well, you have to make sure that your your garden is is properly protected. You're you're actually the one responsible. The the owner of the pig's not responsible if he does damage. You ha- you'll be judged on the security of your fence. So bad blood just kind of started to happen between the 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 two sets of people here, and lots of worse things happened than just land disputes and things like that. You know, Native Americans people died, people were kidnapped, things like that, which led to the wars, uh, the the Indian Wars, starting with King Philip's War, um, King Philip's War. Uh, Philip was also known, his, his, that's his English name, his native name was Metacom, and he came after Passaconaway, a name we all know, who was a chief who recognized um, that there was never going to be a shortage of settlers coming, and that there was no way to war and succeed, so he thought it was best for his people to make peace and try to live amicably. Uh, Metacom didn't agree. We fast forward to King's, King Philip's War. At the end of this, 40% of the Native American population was decimated. When already, upon settlers' arrival, when disease spread, 90%. So the population got cut down by 90% with initial contact. And then after King Philip's War, another 40%. Um, a bunch of promises and treaties were made at the end of King Philip's War. Um, and like treaties are wont to do... They got broken, which then leads us into King William's War, which um, is the time frame in which Hannah was kidnapped. And that's when all these raids were really starting to happen. And raids are exactly what they sound like. Native Americans will come into villages and they will kidnap and they will kill and they will burn down houses and steal and take who is alive captive with the goal in mind to sell them into slavery in Canada or sell their scalps because we have the English fighting their battle that England and France are still fighting their battle here on the new frontier for land grabs. They want to see who's going to get this area of Maine and who's fighting up here. And so that England and France are playing out their games here in the new world. And, um, they were paying Native Americans, Canada was paying Native Americans to bring English prisoners to them. And Native Americans needed money because, as we've discussed with the decimation of their population, um, the decimation of the beaver population, the wildlife population, because uh, settlers weren't thinking about conservation. They weren't thinking about take as much and only as you need. They were thinking take as much as we possibly can because in order for our colonies to succeed, we have to send this stuff back to England. So the Native Americans were in a really crummy situation where this was an opportunity not only for some much warranted revenge, but to sustain their life, to get money. Yeah, so that sets the table to sort of like give an idea of what's going on in sort of the late 1600s. The story of Hannah Dustin sort of talks about her settling in Haverhill in her life. But before we get into the details, and we can talk a little bit more about uh, King William's War as well, but can you talk about like how did you end up like being interested in this? I mean, me and Stomp sort of stumbled on these stories through, you know, doing research on mountains and whatnot. But can you talk about like what? What, how you first found out about this and what motivated you to write a book about it? So about a million years ago, I was a children's librarian in Guilford and I was cleaning out a basement and I found this little like stapled together pamphlet booklet about Hannah Dustin. It's got an image of her statue on it and I took it home and I read it and as anyone who reads this pamphlet or any bit of her story goes, oh my gosh, this is like this horrific story. This is like, I can't even imagine. And then I like went to visit her statue and then kind of forgot about her story and then years later um, I was writing a paper on colonial and Native American relations Um, this was recently I went back to school and Hannah's story came back to me and I was like oh I definitely need to use her story somehow and in researching the her her kidnapping story and the massacre story I started to learn all this other stuff about that happened to her before that even happened and I was like whoa this there's there's something here there's a there's a larger story to tell and recently um her statue has been starting to get a bit controversial 
So I knew that it was a, a timely topic and one I wanted to be part of the conversation. So I said, all right, I've always wanted to write a book. It was my goal. And I found my topic and it was Hannah. Yeah, and I've got the book on order. I haven't read it yet, but I w- my impression with Hannah is that when you say sort of there's more to the story, I would assume the more to that story is just the brutality of surviving life, even up to before she dealt with the, the, the Native American raid. I would imagine that, did she have, was it nine kids? Survive, yes, yeah, surviving. Yeah, I mean, the chance of her surviving nine preg or however many pregnancies yeah. she had in those days is almost a miracle. Astounding. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Hannah, she, um, she faced, like you were saying, the absolute brutality and the, the severity of life can, can't really be imagined. Um, I like to try to imagine it a lot. And that's where I do a lot of my research is in those like very small, simple day to day aspects of a person's life in that time period. But um, she also faced, superstition the Salem witch trials had occurred during her lifetime and this was like a real fear this wasn't something that a couple people in the Salem Danvers area kind of made a mistake on like it was a really concrete belief at that time that like the devil could make you sign a book and that you could have demons and witches and it was a really scary time not just the idea that you could be accused but that you could be attacked Um, so it was it was gnarly times for sure was she a bit more, um, I guess, insulated from that being on the outer edges of the frontier, or did that not oh, matter? Oh, so Hannah's aunt, uncle, and um, cousin were arrested during the witch trials. So it was definitely in the forefront of her knowledge what was happening. So this is very close to home for yeah. her. And can can you talk a little bit about the, the positioning of, the Haver, of Haverhill as a settlement? So I, I would assume settlements made their way north into New Hampshire, into Portsmouth, and I don't know how far inland or how common it was in Dover. I feel like there was a lot going on in Durham and Dover, but up in Haverhill in the northern part of the Merrimack River, how how populated was that area? I'm going to have to Google that answer. I don't actually know yeah. the exact like population, um, but I, knew, I know it was established. I know that, okay. you know, they, they have great records from the time Hannah was alive and that would require, you know, established, uh, you know, settlement for sure. Got it, got it. Well, just sort of like I had some notes here for, so the big picture in New England is, I think around, around that time, around 1600, there was about 60,000 Native Americans across New England. So there was less than one person per square mile across New England. Most of the Native Americans were sort of clustered along the coast, a lot of it, lot in Rhode Island, the Cape, that area. So there wasn't as many up on the North Shore. Um, by the time Hannah was alive, 1700s, there was 150,000 English in New England, and then there was 15,000 French settlers in Canada and northern Maine and that area and really what we would de- what what they were dealing with was a proxy war where F- England and France were in a war in Europe and that war carried over into the new the, the, you know the the new settlements and really what was going on is that the the French were aligned with I believe the Iroquois and then the English were aligned with the remnants of some of the existing tribes loosely and then there was also sort of this third aspect where I think a lot of these tribes were working in their best interest to say like you know hey if there's a raid in an area like they're not going to know whether it's our tribe or a french supported tribe like let's just stir things up and they could sort of i would assume they could play both sides if they wanted to um so it's just a crazy dynamic that she's caught up in and then also she's got this like family dynamic can you talk a little bit about sort of her husband and her family and what's Um, going on there yeah by all accounts her husband um is remembered in history as a solid guy, a good husband, a good father, a good provider. He was um, a brick mason and a builder. The garrison that uh, Hannah uh, returned to after her kidnapping, he actually made the bricks from clay at the river by their house and built the garrison himself. So um, he's he's remembered very well. Um, unfortunately for Hannah and her siblings, her father was not a nice man. Uh, he was extremely abusive. The records show that he was charged with beating his 
13 year old daughter at the time, um, not Hannah, her sister, um, with something called a swindle. Now, um, I also had to look up swindle in my research, and it's a, a a tool used to beat wheat. So it, the only way I could kind of think of to describe it was like, think about like how nunchucks are like two pieces of wood attached, something like this to swing. And it's used to beat your wheat crops. And he used that um, to beat his daughter. Um, and I don't think you have, I don't think somebody beats their child with a swindle and that's an isolated incident. Um, and it's not believed by the Hannah's descendants um, that he was a very kind or good man either. So I think she had a really, really rough childhood on top of the rough life of being a colonist already. Wow. So then she's got, how many how many kids did she have at the time of the, so the story of Hannah is basically like there was a raid in Haverhill where she was captured. Um, how many kids did she have when she She'd when actually, um, which makes her story even more compelling to me. She actually was six days postpartum from her ninth child when the raid happened. Um, so when she was marched through the woods, um, she was dealing with severe cervical cramping. Sorry, I don't know if this is going to get too gnarly for a hiking podcast, but that meant she was also dealing with bleeding. Um, she had to deal with the drying up of her breast milk, like all these really horrifying things, really painful things that women experience um, that she should have been in bed for. It was like one of the only times colonial women were allowed to rest was right after birth because it was recognized that they needed to, to rest. And she got six days of rest and then was dragged into the woods. Wow. And what happened with the? And I don't want to give away the whole book here, but um, you know, as as best as you can with your judgment, what was what happened during that raid? How many people were involved? And then, can you just talk a little bit directionally about where they ended up? Yeah, um, I feel pretty comfortable talking a little bit about uh, the the kidnapping and the massacre. I mean, you could you anyone could end this podcast and Google it and get that information pretty quickly. And a lot of people already know it. So um, she was kidnapped with uh, other members of her community, but her um, midwife and her infant daughter and dragged into the woods. Um, they started in Haverhill and eventually after a couple weeks of travel made it up to like the Bosquin area uh, for anyone that may be a little easier, the Concord area in New Hampshire. Um, they didn't obviously go in a straight line. Like if you put in Haverhill to Bosquin, it's like 29 miles, but they, they zigzagged throughout the woods. It took them two weeks to get there. Uh, during that time, they weren't really provided food. Uh, they weren't provided shelter. And I think this is some of the stuff that can start to tie in for us hikers in this story. This was March, March 15th in New England. I think we all know that like, you know, yeah, down at Hannaford, maybe the snow is melted, but the snow is not totally melted. It's in the process of melting and you're post holing and you're cutting up your shins if you post hole. And it's just miserable conditions in March in the woods. And this is what she was being dragged through without being offered food. Um, they, they were never given a place to sleep. Uh, it was pretty brutal. And some, and some really horrifying things happened on trail to Hannah uh, that no person should have to experience. Um, I don't want to give all of, like I said, I don't want to give the whole book away, but some, some really, really, tragic things happened that I think definitely affected the decisions she made um, in retaliation to her captors. Yeah, and all this is basically they're going along the Merrimack, but I'm assuming the river's running pretty hot because you've got snow melt. Mm -hmm. You probably maybe even still have some ice in the river, and then if you fall in, it's game over, and then it's not like you're going to be able to take a boat and move long distances up river with the current flowing like that, that time of the year, I would assume. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All the stuff I thought about when I, uh, when I was writing this book, I would hike in the woods and think about this a lot. Like, I would try to imagine being Hannah, and I'm, I'm in my, all my proper gear with my good footwear, and um, it was, there's, there's a rumor where it's, it's one of those facts where it's like, some people believe this is the truth. Some people don't. But um, one of the stories was that she actually only had one shoe, that she didn't make it out of the house getting both shoes on when she started this. So I just try to imagine, like, never mind unfit colonial shoes, like a bare foot on that ice, like that snow. Yeah, that's crazy. Now, what's the um, what's the structure of the book? Is it, like, written like a typical sort of history book? Is nope. it... Um, talk about that. Yeah, it's a historical fiction. So um, I wanted to stay true to Hannah's story and her family's story as much as I possibly could when I was writing this book. But as with all historical 
works, I can actually know a conversation between Hannah and her daughter or her husband or her father. I'm going to have to make that stuff up to flesh out the story. So I, I always remind people that this is a work of fiction. I, I stick to the facts that my research provided me to plot out the book and to bring the story together. But there are things that, you know, that didn't necessarily happen, but were just, you know, I added in for effect of how to explain what life was like during that time. I really wanted to stay true to to that as well. Yeah, and I, I always love the um, the blue ba- the um, historical fiction books. Like when I was a kid growing up, I used to read this guy Alan Eckert, who wrote a bunch of books about like Daniel Boone and the Shawnee Indians and Blue Jacket and that whole story. So I'll actually link in the show notes some of those books as well. And he used that same style is he sort of did the assumption about like, okay, I'm going to bring this into sort of historical fiction and, and put dialogue in this in the book, which is cool. Yeah. I think it brings history alive for people when you take it out of a textbook and you humanize it for them and you give these people actual personalities and, and day-to-day experiences and it lets you relate to them a little bit more. So having written that book and having, you know, delved into the history what's your take on the current political atmosphere around her yeah, um, really... statue and just tell us about what's going on with the statue and who's doing it and why because it seems like this woman made rational decisions under her circumstances um yeah it's a really it's a tough situation um it's a tough topic Uh, Because as her statues stand now, there's one um, in New Hampshire, one in Massachusetts, and she's like holding Native American scalps in her hand. Uh, And her statues were erected like 10 years after to like go, hey, Hannah, thank you for your service. You know, they were erected during Manifest Destiny when people were trying to turn turn people against Native Americans and to kind of let us turn our heads as we were purposefully eradicating them so we could gain more westward land. That said, um, I am not an advocate for tearing down Hannah statues. Um, I don't think as they stand currently that they are enough. I think it's an awesome space to really hold um, the truth. And I think they need to be expanded upon. I think both locations are in parks, and I think they can have signs, more information, yeah, context. an accurate layout of the history. Yes, context, exactly. I think that it's really, it's a missed opportunity. It has remained a missed opportunity not to have that context, because I have equal amounts of sympathy for the Native Americans as I do Hannah. I can see both sides of the situation, and I think both sides deserve their story to be told truthfully. Um, Currently, there is a faction of people that definitely just want to tear it down. They want the statues gone. They people you, you must have heard, you know, I think you talked about it actually, like thrown red paint on it. There's always graffiti at her sites. Uh, but there's a loyal group of descendants that want to keep Hannah's story alive who also have great sympathy for the experience of the Native Americans. And um, they are working towards moving forward together. The, the hope is something will happen that isn't just tearing these statues down but that creates some kind of unity finally between you know the native americans and the settlers through through all of the descendants hope hopefully that's my greatest hope personally that i really would like to see those spaces turned into a a place where people like shook hands and met together instead of fought over Yeah, and it's so much of this comes down to this idea that like it's complicated and it's not a situation where you can just say like, okay, this one side's good, this one side's evil, and then, you know, we're going to just put everybody in their nice little boxes. Like we've talked about this, like this whole, you know, we talked about like the the House of Dragons and Game of Thrones and how it's politically complicated and there's no, in a lot of cases, like there's no bad person and no good person it's just people are looking out for their interest in their families as best they can i think this is a perfect example of like you know hannah was clearly a very strong person and had lived a life like i I keep going back to this idea of her having nine children that survived like the fact that she survived those pregnancies is an absolute miracle and then you know to be raided and kidnapped and to see some of her children die 
you know, and then to to be able to make her way back in a perilous journey over the course of like weeks and weeks being captured is just it's a miracle that she survived and to just discount it as like she was just being brutal towards Native Americans it's it's just more complicated than that and almost everything that we deal with when we run into these controversies right now is it's complicated and it's not something that you can just put in the neat little boxes a hundred percent agreed yeah yeah. So, um, can you talk a little bit? I'm curious. Like, what are the direct sources that we have that we so that we know about Hannah? Um, I know you're a fan of Belknap. He writes about it. Um, but the main, like, contemporary source that has um, Cotton Mather. I'm a, I'm a yep. huge non fan of Cotton Mather. As as a uh, historian, <laughs> I have a very good ability to not look through my own modern eyes at situations and and look at the current time I'm, I'm researching and, and understanding the things that make me uncomfortable wouldn't have made them uncomfortable with Cotton Mather is just he's not a very good person so I um, I don't mention him in my book he doesn't even have one page in my book um, but his he 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 met with Hannah when she or had to come back she comes to Boston and he does meet with her um, and he also had a uh, relationship not an inappropriate relationship but a, a relationship with her sister in another situation her sister faces um so he would probably be the go-to all right and then he was involved in the witch trials right so he was so he also was involved in the witch trials that yeah. makes sense and then um i had in my notes here that there was also also some records in the commonwealth of massachusetts due to the scalp bounty is that correct yeah so um Previous to Hannah being um, kidnapped, you could go. I think, I think it was you'd get like fifty pounds, like fifty pounds or whatever, for a Native American scalp, um, and that had been eradicated like right before Hannah was kidnapped. But her husband wanted to press the matter, so that's why they ended up in Boston was to go bring these scalps to see if they could get any money under saying that their home was burned during the raid so there was nothing left that's why she was staying at the garrison after her return so i i assume thomas her husband was like look everything we own is burned down we need some money let's just see if we can get something for these scalps um and i don't i don't personally believe um that hannah necessarily wanted to do that but they had a house to build so wow and then um how do we get the book um, I was going to share a link to my website with you, and you could share that. I've started a little called a Historian's Musing. Um, it's just me kind of sharing little write-ups about the places I visit, suggestions on books, suggestions on museums, things like that. And I have a, a place there to purchase the book, and I'm happy to ship it off to anybody who'd like it. Awesome. Yeah, cool. We'll include that in the show notes. And uh, um I'm assuming that direct link is better than Amazon for you. Yeah, yeah, it's better for everybody. Amazon takes a little longer. Yeah, than it's I better do, so. for uh, Mrs. Stomp too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Working for the U.S. Post, yeah. she's delivering Amazon. So, find a thank you for getting uh, all my books to people. I appreciate it, Mrs. Stomp. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you order something Anytime. really heavy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll order 50, 50 books. <laughs> um, what any other projects coming up, or is this? Um, um, is this your only thing going now, on right now? Uh, my website actually is my next big project because I, I said I'd never write another book again because it was such an exhaustive process. But I, I still guess. love writing and I still love history. So it's kind of, this has become my new outlet that I'm going to try to, you know, have a blog where I can geek out on like the historical sites I go visit and these little ideas that come to mind. And uh, hopefully, hopefully some other people might think it's kind of cool and follow along and enjoy what I write. Awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting the book and and, and getting the um, you know, your perspective on it. And I'll definitely follow up with more details once I've I've read it. I'm sure it's going to be a five star review. I expect that. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> As my friend, no, yeah. no, honest reviews only. Honest reviews only. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, Stomp, anything else? Any other questions about Hannah? Sure. Yeah, we talk about the creative process. How many times did you? read your book and and oh re-edit and refine it's like it, uh, it just to, to remind listeners like it, whether it's music or painting or you know writing a book it's the same creative process and it's really cool or crafting a beer it's the same thing so how many times did you craft your beer 
Um, I can tell you I never want to read my beer again. <laughs> um, I, I, I think I, I must have read some chapters, you know, I'm not kidding, like 50 Isn't times, it funny? like 50 plus times. And then like, and that when I say I had to, that also means Dan had to. Like every chapter oh. I finished, he would get the chapter. And then That's I would great. change things and he would do it again. Like he was the greatest support the whole time of writing that book. Like he, yeah, an editor. He, yeah, he was a great That's editor and like, totally uh had my back through that whole process but that's super no, it's, cool it's, it's a lot of work for sure yeah. absolutely yeah maybe it'll get picked up by like hbo they'll do like a limited series or, or a movie or <laughs> fingers something, crossed so. right yeah right right they'll give it the game of thrones treatment <laughs> hmm. well that's an interesting awesome. question because it's such a hot button topic in some ways i mean that would be an amazing limited series. Like, get the right uh, writers, and yeah, that's cool. Who I, knows? I, I, I agree. I think. Yeah, totally. I think it's timely. I think it's timely. No it question is. about it. Yeah. And outlets like HBO or some, you know, maybe not Netflix so much now, but some of these outlets definitely are looking for that type of story that can grab all genres and and you know audience tastes and whatnot without i don't know what's the word being offensive or i don't know it's well there's yeah. just so much going on like yeah. with this story and like you could go in a lot of different directions but ultimately like the, the sort of the sort of power, powerful woman angle and then the political angle like there's a lot going on there that could be really fascinating so absolutely if anybody's listening that's like in charge of making series for <laughs> hbo or netflix like <laughs> Reach out to Tasha. Yeah, please hit me up. <laughs> right, right. So. Slasher gets ten percent. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Done. <laughs> But Stomp, we're two hours in, so I don't know if we want to bail on the search and rescue news and just push that to next episode, or do you want to go? Is there anything pressing? I think we should just talk at least about <laughs> one dehydration and one eagle crag. Let's do that. Okay. There's been a right, lot so... of dehydration cases lately, and people just need to be aware of this situation. Okay, yeah, we probably do Mount Washington as well. So, okay, so... Um... Yeah, we'll start with Mount Washington here. So this, and then we've got some national stories, but we'll push those to um, the next episode. So, and then t Tasha and Mrs. Stomp, get ready, because we are going to take a photo to post on our Instagram in a, in a little while. I'll, I'll give you a heads up first. But okay, yeah, get, I did that get for yourself, you, Alexandria. <laughs> get yourself situated. I need to be prepared. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. But uh, so this first case, so a Canadian man collapses and dies while hiking Mount Washington. So this happened on Thursday, um, August 25th at approximately 340. New Hampshire Fishing Game was notified of a man receiving CPR on the summit of Mount Washington. So due to the patient's location at the time of the incident, he was transported to the base of Mount Washington Auto Road. So... Um, I guess a, a conservation officer had overheard the call on his radio, was in close proximity to the auto road, so he responded to assist the medical personnel and the patient whose identity had not yet been disclosed at the time of the release. The only information provided is that the hiker's a 46-year-old man from Quebec. Um, I guess he had been on a, a day hike with his adult son. They had gone up Amanusik Ravine and reached Lake of the Clouds. At that point, um, the man began complaining of shortness of breath. But, I mean, you got, we all know, like, you get to Lake of the Clouds and you're looking up and the, the mountain looks like it's right there. So, unfortunately, he decided to move forward and just feet from reaching the summit parking lot, um, the gentleman collapsed and his son rushed to his aid. State park staff were alerted to the incident and um, they deployed a um, defibrillator device and performed CPR. And there was also two nurses and a doctor that were hiking that day that came on the scene. So... The, the the experts were were there, but unfortunately, um, unfortunately, the um, you know the, all efforts to to save him were uh, were not fruitful. So um, he he passed away, and um, yeah, it's basically the story. Yeah, it sure is. It's not good. 
I guess the lesson there is like listen to your body. Like if you feel like something's going going wrong, like listen to your body. Um, and then the next one here, Stomp. Which one is the the dehydration one? Well, that's a national story. Um, that is a Mojave oh. Desert story. Actually, PCT hiker requires rescue due to severe dehydration. And then there is um, three hikers rescued and one dead after getting dehydrated while in the Mojave Desert. So, you know, we can skip them for now, but... I mean, obviously out west, it's a whole different ball game, but... We are experiencing hot weather here. Just when you're out there making sure that you you have enough fluids, electrolytes, know where your springs are, your water sources. Mike talked about his three-day PEMI. He planned out where he could get water ahead of time. Just do your homework before you head out because it's still pretty hot out there. Yeah, yeah. And I guess we're on national news. I might as well throw this in here. There was a, uh, um, a hiker that fell um, at the Bright Angel Trail at, in the Grand Canyon. So there's a news article that happened in NBC. I actually came to know that, um, and this isn't out there, I don't think yet, but this was a Massachusetts resident that had fallen to um, his death. 44-year-old gentleman uh, from Massachusetts was uh, you know, there with his family and unfortunately um, slipped, fell over the edge, I think fell about 200 feet. If you've ever been to the Grand Canyon, like, you know, it's tough to visualize, but if you've been there, you understand like there is so many of these spots where you can just, if you get to the edge and you start slipping, like you can just go. And that's just, I think, what happened with this gentleman. So sad story. And then um, the last story we have before we wrap up is a climber fell on Eagle Crag Stomp. So do you want to you want to give the rundown on this one? Um, I don't know too much about it. I have not read the statement, but I can tell you that this call came in late yesterday and there was an individual that was climbing. It was a climbing accident and they were severely injured. No further details beyond that other than they were, you know, less than say a quarter mile in. If anybody's familiar with the area, you have Echo Lake um, Canna Mountain. Oh, it's it's Echo Crags, not Eagle. I, re- I, re- I read that wrong. No, it's Eagle. It's Eagle Crag, Echo Lake. Um, it's okay. that whole region. Artist Bluff to the north. So this individual had a climbing accident and was carried out. And that's pretty much all the details we have at this point now. Um, not, not common, but happens enough there. There have been several over the years, so... You know, it's, I was, I was talking to somebody earlier about this and I hate to say it, but this is why I will never climb. It's it's the airplane analogy. It's like airplanes are the safest way to travel until they're not. Like I just, mm, climbing is just so risky. Seems like there's just a lot to keep track of. There's like a lot going on with climbing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And we don't know the details of this, but. Uh, yeah, wish him the best. And uh. all right, well, Tasha, you made it. What do you think? Did it go by quickly? It went by much quicker than I thought, and I, you know, I, <laughs> I didn't throw up from nerves or anything. And I was, I certainly thought that was a possibility before we started recording. But I think oh, Mrs. Stomp's very... presence sure helped me feel a, a little more at ease. Aw, it was a really nice time. I mean, yeah, you, you guys are great too. But Mrs. Stomp, you know. You know, she's, she's the star. Yeah, she is a star. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm here for Team Tasha. <laughs> <laughs> Team Tasha. Team Tasha. No, I'm boy. really psyched. Your book sounds awesome. I, I would love to read it, actually. Me and, too. Um, best of luck with you, Dan, and all your pets. <laughs> <laughs> Before you <Our> start. <laughs> or zoo you of animals. Cats. Yeah, Mrs. Stomp is scheming now to get another cat, I think. Oh, probably. <laughs> I have so many comments now because I didn't want to, I wasn't supposed to be here, but I just wanted to support Tasha and say <laughs> hi to her. But I was saying how happy I was that she was talking about that she got cats because I know she was a dog person. So, And I've been asking Mr. Stomp that our youngest, Daphne, needs a playmate. Just saying. She does. Oh, she does. Thank you. That's probably Thank true. You. She really does. Yeah, because Luna's just like... 
Yep. Luna's checking That's out. She's just the elder, elderly cat. Yeah. yeah. Let's go kitty shopping together. <gasps> Aww, she goes, can she we? go look at some rescues. <laughs> yes. Aww, I love that'd that. Be interesting. I love that. But before you started talking about your book, one comment I wanted to make when you were talking about <laughs> finishing your 48 and you said you're like I'm gonna write a chapter on every friggin summit I did I was like spoken like a true librarian I love yes. this chick <laughs> I don't know what they thought about that manuscript when it arrived. I also covered the entire manila envelope with cut out pictures of all the hikes. And like the of whole course. thing was like front and cover, just like. That was your first like, book. What, what is this person? Yeah, it was. It was. I love that. For sure. Yeah, and I was and honest. I was honest about my trip reports. I wasn't like, we were perfect hikers and we did everything right. We never made any bad choices. I was like, look, here's what happened. Like every time. We started so. drinking at this. Yeah. You know, I would trailhead. love. <laughs> I'd love to be a fly in the wall at the AMC committee when they're all sitting around <laughs> reading these thousands of essays. Like that yeah. would be really funny. <laughs> I hope mine brighten their day a little bit. I, you know, I'm sure somebody thought the content meant I should be disqualified from the patch, but somebody else did it, and I have it. So <laughs> that's excellent. Well, thank you again for coming on. This has been great. Yeah, it was a ton of fun, guys. Thank you for having me. You bet. All right, and you've inspired me. I'm going to go find my 4,000 footer club essay, and maybe. Uh, so, if you want to send me your um, the link to your essay, Tasha, I'll put that on our um, Facebook page, and then I'm going to look at mine and see if it's not too embarrassing. I might add mine too. <laughs> I gotta, I'll look for mine. I'll see. Uh, I'll see how much I want to yeah. disclose to a th- hundred thousand listeners. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I want geez. them to know all of those stories. Yeah, and send us the links, too, to everything that you want to put in there. And then last but not least, so we're going to call this a wrap, but before we leave, we're going to take a picture here. So let's get ready. So, Stomp, you got to get in the screen here. So there we go. (laughs) All right, get ready. Three, two, one. Am I looking the right way? Everyone say, (laughs) Everyone say, Hannah Dustin! Woo! (laughs) Yeah, yeah, Hannah Dustin. (laughs) So, all right. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you want to learn more about the topics covered in today's show, please check out the show notes and safety information at slasherpodcast.com. That's S-L-A-S-R podcast.com. You can also follow the show on Facebook and Instagram. We hope you'll join us next week for another great show. Until then, on behalf of Mike and Stomp, Get out there and crush some mega peaks. Now covered in scratches, blisters, and bug bites, Chris Staff wanted to complete his most challenging day hike ever. Fish and game officers say the hiker from Florida activated an emergency beacon yesterday morning. He was hiking along the Appalachian Trail when the weather started to get worse. Officials say the snow was piled up to three feet in some spots and there was a wind chill of minus one degree. And there's three words to describe this race. Do we all know what they are? Only one hill! Here's Lieutenant James Neeland, New Hampshire Fish and Game. Lieutenant, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. What are some of the most common mistakes you see people make when they're heading out on the trails to hike here in New Hampshire? It seems to me the most common is being unprepared, and I think if they just simply visited uh, hikesafe.com and got a list of the 10 essential items and had those in their packs, they probably would have no need to ever call us at all.